Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first stop of the virtual BC Cup presented by Cobotics. First of four races over the next few weeks here as we take things virtual on the RGT platform. Brad Soner here with the voice of virtual cycling in British Columbia, Ryan Cousineau. Ryan, uh, a new type of racing here for a lot of people over the last few years, and uh, it's been growing. It's been incredible to watch uh, the level that uh, the riding on this platform has grown to, it's uh, its going to be some tough racing over the next, uh, well, let's do hours today. We have four different races that uh, we're going to be running. Riders will be combined in Category 4 and Open Women. The Category 2 and 3s will be up next. And then Pro Women followed by the Pro Men. So, Ryan, we're going to get a crash course in RGT today. I know this is new for a lot of people. So uh, we'll do our best to kind of guide people through the learning curve here on RGT. But uh, it's exciting to give these riders a chance to race here, kind of get back together with our cycling family that uh, I know you guys up in BC have been missing a lot this year. It sure is exciting, Brad. In these uncertain times, I know that so many of these riders would love to be back out on the road, mixing it up in a day that I can tell you from here in the wilds of British Columbia is looking a little miserable, just perfect for bike racing. But of course, in the RGT platform, the weather outside is always delightful. So we're going to be racing on uh, the virtual RGT roads. The real hook to RGT, the cool part about this platform, is the ability to upload real courses to the platform. So we're going to be racing on uh, today, racing on the Paderberg, the real-life Paderberg course. So it'll be kind of a chance to, to uh, test yourself on that climb. The riders are going to get a chance to basically ride what it would be like to ride the Paderberg. It's only uh, right around six kilometers around on the loop, but it's that big hill, the legendary Paderberg climb that, uh, that does it. You see 4.25 kilometers kilometers around today. So uh, I think that's where this race is going to be won and lost. Our first race of the day uh, coming up at 830 is going to be doing four laps of this circuit. Second race will do six laps. That's the category twos and threes. And then pro women doing six laps of this course and pro men doing eight. So uh, especially in virtual racing, Ryan, it, these climbs hurt. Uh, and uh, it, it makes it a whole lot tougher to do on the trainer. Obviously, you don't have to deal with the cobbles. You don't have to deal with the weather, anything like that. But uh, virtual racing is incredibly tough, as I'm sure you've come to find out. Oh, absolutely, Brad. You know, uh, nothing quite uh, lives up to the uh, pain and agony of uh, doing an actual climb. But you know, the beautiful simulacrum of, uh, of virtual racing still allows you that heartbreaking experience of watching the field just crawl away from you at about five kilometers an hour as your race ends. It's incredibly realistic getting dropped on RGT. I do have to say it's, uh, it's amazingly realistic, uh, especially for new riders. I hope that all the riders today had a chance to, to at least test the platform a little bit, get to know the physics, because there are uh, some specific ins and outs of RGT that, uh, that we're going to talk about throughout the day. I think the biggest one, the most easily missed one, Ryan, is uh, the start. When, uh, when the flag drops on the virtual platforms, you want to have your power all the way up. You want to be doing your ramp basically in the countdown to the start so that when the, when it gets to zero you're essentially at max power and you shoot off the line which you obviously can't do in real life kind of like a standing start on the track i guess but uh, that's one of the most common first time mistakes of starting a virtual race is uh, starting at zero and then thinking that you're going to build up after the flag drops that is not the case <laughs> these uh, these fields take off pretty quickly as uh, as the flag drops so it's going to be interesting to watch the riders at the start today Absolutely, Brad. I'd compare it to a cyclocross start where you do see yeah, those kind of go. from the gun straight out the wall. But the, the difference is in a cyclocross start, it's frowned upon if you're actually spinning your cranks before <laughs> the gun goes off. Uh, not so in virtual racing where everybody will be spun up to pretty much their max starting RPMs right before the flag goes. So for you amateurs who may not have done too many of these races, Start thinking about basically ramping up your power, something like two minutes to go, and at about the 10-second mark, you want to be very close to your maximum. Yeah, a cyclocross start is maybe the best way to describe it. Actually, uh, RGT is constantly working on the physics of the game, the way that riders interact with each other, the drafting, things like that. Uh, I know recently they've been working on these starts to turn off the collision avoidance or the, the collision physics at the start to make sure that everyone had a, a clean shot to get through. Eventually, as things settle down in the race, the, uh, the physics do sort of contain you if you're in the group. It takes a little while to sort of work your way through the group. So if you're at the back, you can't just launch 
launch an attack and shoot through the group if uh, if there's a bunch of riders with you. So that uh, is is a little lessened at the start, and that gives riders a, a chance to uh, to kind of move a little more slowly at the start. So hopefully that makes for a better experience for more riders. It will break up a lot out there today. So uh, riders, if this is your first time racing on the RGT platform, don't be surprised if uh, you see a lot of breakup early on. This will break down into smaller groups, usually out on RGT. That's how most of these races have been playing out. You very rarely see a big group that will stay all the way to the line. So if your goal is to try and finish in the main group, well, there isn't really a main group, to be honest with you. A lot of times uh, it comes down to maybe three or four select riders at the finish. So uh, don't be surprised if you find yourself ending up in a group of two or three riders. Best thing to do there, Ryan, just lock in, try and figure out the drafting in the small groups, and then have a little race within the race. There's going to be a lot of them out there today. So uh, it'll be a, a new experience for a lot of riders, and I hope it's a good one. I hope, uh, hope they enjoy the virtual racing here. I know I am not a big fan of the trainer. I have a really hard time riding on the trainer like I know a lot of riders do, but the virtual platforms make it a little easier, uh, pass maybe an hour or two, a little bit, uh, little bit easier than you could just on the trainer trying to watch a movie. So some riders though have been embracing this racing. I uh, have been watching uh, Matt Usborne, we were talking about just before the start of the show, raced with us in the virtual echelon racing league uh, uh, I think 12, maybe 14 stops on that one. Uh, Matt has fully embraced virtual cycling. So we'll see a lot of riders out there today that are what I would call experts on RGT. Well, you know, Matt's a borderline triathlete, a kind of racer that does the absolute best in virtual cycling where, you know, you don't need a sprint so, quite so much. And doubly so on a course like today where we've got that lovely Paderborg wall to uh, separate out the field but also uh, doesn't need to have any pack handling skills either. Perfect for a triathlete. Funny you mentioned that because our uh, in the pro women's field, uh, one name stuck out to me. That was Jackie Godby, a uh, triathlete turned virtual bike racer. Uh, also watched her dominate in the Echelon Racing League over the last few months. So uh, I think Godby is the one to watch in the women's race and uh, another triathlete. So maybe there is something to people that have incredibly strong aerobic ability and no bike handling skills. I am very excited to see how uh, Jacqueline matches up with uh, some of our local pros. Um, some of the names that I'm very excited to see out there. Esther Beauville is a threat at any time in any place. Uh, Pamela Troyer is no uh, small threat herself. I know that uh, Fiona Vincendi races for the uh, very good Red Truck team locally. Um, and today I think she will be partnering on the Pickle Juice Squad with Claire Cameron, a past provincial champion in at least one discipline, and I think more than one. So uh, that could be a pretty exciting. Uh, that could be a pretty exciting field for our uh, pro women. But I think first up, we're going to have the open women and the Cat Four men, and I believe we can see the start line for the Cat Fours right now. Note this would be the women, and now we've yeah, got we go the, the men's fours. field on this side. Yeah, so this gives you a good idea of uh, what we're going to be looking at for most of the race today. Let's talk about some of the things on the screen right now. I want to start with uh, the leaderboard on the left-hand side. You see uh, six names on there right now. One name is highlighted. You see Alfred's is a little bit darker than uh, Archange or uh, our, our uh, robotic camera, our cam out on course, the ZMS cam. That is showing the stats of the, the rider that we're watching. So you see the stats in the upper left and upper right-hand corner. Those will correspond with the rider who's highlighted with a little darker bar over to the left-hand side. Now you can see obviously the jersey that they're wearing, their nationality, the name, and then the number to the right is their current watts per kilogram. So we'll also be able to watch that to see sort of what zone they're in, where they are uh, in their, uh, their relative power. All these riders have to enter their power numbers, what's called the FTP, your functional threshold power, and then the game figures out what their different zones are. We'll actually be able to see those zones with a color bar. You see, actually it's popping up underneath a few of the names right now uh, for the riders out on course. See that green bar that just popped up? You'll see some bluish uh, kind of blue-green bars coming up as well. Those are the power bars that show the different zones that the riders are in. And uh, basically green is the easiest pedaling, red is the hardest pedaling that, uh, that you can go through in the zone. So we'll be watching for the power zones that they're in. We'll be watching their watts per kilogram. You also see up in the upper left-hand corner, you see their current cadence, the, uh, the speed that they're spinning the cranks, and their current heart rate. 
And then the upper left or upper right hand side, that's sort of the course information shows uh, the distance ridden, distance remaining. That map in the, the middle shows sort of the, the kilometer behind them and kilometer ahead of them, I guess. So uh, an elevation profile, if you will. It'll also show the other riders on course as our riders take off. So uh, you'll see those little dots start to separate out here a little bit as uh, we get underway. We're going to be watching both of these races at the same time. We'll keep our women's open and cat for men's screens up until we start to see those initial selections, initial breakups. Uh, let's start with the left-hand side of the screen here, Ryan. Looks like two riders getting away here as uh, you see Duke going into the red. So this is what I was talking about with the color zones. Duke going deep here early on. Red is the top power. They actually call it the pain threshold and uh, usually can't hold on to that red zone for more than five or six minutes. So Duke getting to this one early here, and Colin, the only one that can go with her. So this is what I was talking about. See how it's two and two here, these riders linking up. But how about Duke here? Definitely the antagonist here early on in the women's open race. That's Andrea Duke from the local Marilomas uh, Cycling Club. Uh, Marilomas is a great local institution. They actually were founded as a rugby club many, many years ago, but have recently uh, gotten into cycling. So they put out a fair number of good riders into our local fields. And racing against her is Liz Cullen, and I can see Tammy Brimner coming not that far off the back. Tammy is also the race photographer for this event. I don't know if Tammy's she's... in there taking pictures or racing. I, I know she does both. I know she's been riding on RGT a lot as well as uh, in our races taking pictures. The way that she does it by, is by being in the race, uh, obviously in order to get those in-race photos. So... Uh, one, looking forward to seeing the photos, and two, looking forward to watching Tammy if uh, if she is in here racing. Yeah, I suspect that uh, she's not routinely putting out three watts per kilogram, so I don't want to tease Tammy about that too much. But uh, <laughs> if she is putting yeah, out three yeah. watts per kilogram, then she's been putting a lot more uh, time on her trainer than I have. Yeah, so you'll also see the ZMS cams that are in the race uh, in last place in both of our races right now, a Cat 4 Men and Women's Open. Those are the camera bots that are out on course. So uh, those aren't real competitors. If you see them pushing out crazy numbers or rapidly moving up in the group, something like that, uh, or just repositioning the cameras. Uh, Damon over at ZMS Livestream is uh, doing all of our coverage today, doing an awesome job bringing you these live images of virtual racing, something uh, I never thought that I would say two years ago. But here we are with uh, a virtual camera operator in the UK, a commentator in Canada, and one in Pittsburgh in the United States. Pretty crazy world we live in here in 2021. Yes, Pittsburgh, famous as the home of the Tour de Quarantine, one of the greatest <laughs> races that happened last year. Maybe uh, one of the few good things to come out of the, the last year, in addition to uh, virtual racing, of course. Yes, it was so fantastic to see very cute dog win that event. It's such a shocking surprise on the last day. You know, reminiscent really of uh, the defeat of Fignon by Le Monde yeah. in the Tour de yeah. France. It was, it was controversial, that's for sure. Uh, we are working with RGT to try and get very, very good dog into the game. See if we can add some of those characters as avatars in here. I think that would be pretty cool have the chance to race as a Jimmy John's delivery guy or something like that to, on RGT. The teams actually can get their jerseys in here uh, if uh, a team wants to sort of mount a campaign on RGT or they're using RGT a lot as a club. Uh, RGT can put the jerseys in there pretty easily. There's a little bit of a setup cost like anything, but uh, you will see some riders with custom jerseys out there like uh, over on our Cap 4 men, you see Arcane here. I think that's one of the Project Echelon jerseys that uh, he's wearing up at the front. Very good, yes. Um, and I'm just, let's see, who have we got in this race today? Why am I? Yeah, and he's racing against Walker. Let's take a look at who we've got in these uh, in this Cap 4 field and see if we can tell you a little bit about these uh, fine men. So this group got, of three, actually, uh, this, this is a good race. Alfred's trying to hang on to the back here, but see how he's in the red zone right now. This is a deep, deep effort. It doesn't really show it on RGT. You can't really see how hard the guys are riding on RGT, but like Alfred's is very close to puke mode right now, trying to hold on to the back of these two uh, going up the Paderberg. So when you see that red, that's serious. I mean, uh, most riders can't hold it this long. So Alfred's is putting in a massive effort, but he knows he needs to get up on that wheel and he's only got one shot at it because if he doesn't get back up here, that's probably going to be it for him. So uh, you might as well try and go deep, stay in the red zone as long as you can here to try and get back in. 
Yeah, this descent is his chance to regroup, and you can see he's yep. putting in more power than Arkang and uh, yep. Arkenj. I'll get that name right, I apologize. Uh, and uh, Alfred's, and there he is. He's regrouped with them. Nicely done. Way to fight back for Alfred's here. Yeah, good strategy. And I think so they've this left... Is, uh, I was going to say, this I think is they've another left thing Aiken you see and Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Down to three here. A lot of times you'll see riders surge from the back and then go all the way to the front. Uh, they sort of overcompensate for the power that they need to catch back on. And then by the time uh, the physics and game catch up to them, they're already past the rider. So there is a little bit of an art to staying in the group. Uh, Arkang and Walker here doing a nice job riding together. I'm going to guess these are these, both of these riders have experience on RGT because uh, it does take a little bit of skill to ride in a group of two this tightly on uh, on the platform and i think those two are doing it nicely alfred's out for a tt this morning he's just going to head out on his own i wonder if he can make this stick it's a long way to go for these cat fours and he's climbing up is this the virtual paterberg climb here that we're yeah. on yep mm -hmm. 8.6 yeah, so degree can... slope 8.6 yep, percent up in the top right corner climbing. you can see both the profile and the current slope and they even built in the fans and uh, and the cobbles. It's kind of eerie to see people standing that close together. But don't worry, <laughs> folks. They're all virtual. As we crest 12 percent, and you can you can almost feel the pain radiating off of these riders, grinding up there. I'm sure, their smart trainers are dialing in more resistance than they've ever experienced in their lives. Now yeah, we're this is back where they, the women's open. They start and to overheat like we've got the trainer. <laughs> so it looks like Liz Collin is trying to put a gap on her uh, competitor there. Yeah, so uh, let's talk Andrea about gaps. Duke. This is a good chance to talk about gaps. Uh, I skipped over this earlier when we were talking about uh, the leaderboard on the left-hand side of the screen. You can also see the distance between the riders uh, all the way to the right of their name. You see the name and then the watts per kilogram and then the distance between the riders. So Colin and Duke, Colin's only five meters ahead of Duke right now. And then Lane is going to be 115 meters back behind them. So on RGT, it measures in distance instead of time. It's a little easier for the riders. It's more, uh, uh, I don't want to say gamified, but it's just a, a better measure of how to chase riders down on the RGT platform. Duke here, I think, just had a power drop out. It looked like she had stopped registering zero. We see this a lot where riders have a Wi-Fi or or uh, power issues at home, it is uh, pretty rare to see a rider stop and put a foot down on RGT. So I wonder if she just lost connection there for a second. Oh dear, looks like you can have a virtual mechanical as well as a yep. real one. Yep, it's always uh, something. I also, noticed, I also noticed that Andrea's avatar was simulating uh, standing up out of the pedals. Do you know how the RGT picks that up? Is it based on seeing the power inputs or just does it go by uh, high effort? Yeah, I think it's based on a, a certain increase. Uh, I think it's a percentage increase in wattage uh, that determines if they're standing up. Obviously, there's no way to tell in real life uh, to tell the game if they're standing up. But yeah, if, if they're standing up, a lot of times they are standing up in real life because it means there's been a significant surge of power into, uh, into the avatar. So you'll also see the power kind of spike sometimes. Uh, up on the upper left-hand corner below the three numbers uh, that, uh, that show the power, the cadence and the heart rate. That is their power graph in between the leaderboard and the three numbers up in the top left. That's a sort of a running watts per kilo tracker for the last like 15 or 20 seconds, however long this graph is, you see it moves along. So if you see a rider that goes into the red zone or stands up, something like that, you can look up and check the graph. And if we're, uh, if we're following that rider, you'll see, you'll see that spike in power. It gives you a better idea of where they are sort of in general compared to how they've been riding for the last uh, last few minutes. And now it switches over to the drafting indicator, which uh, is showing the watts that they're saving by drafting off the rider in front of them. It'll also give tips on uh, how close to get uh, to maximize your drafting ability up there. So that's what you'll see sort of uh, switching back and forth in the upper left-hand corner. It only shows the drafting indicator when you're close enough to, to uh, engage in a draft that'll pop up and then when you're all alone like colin here it'll show the power meter 
Now look at what's happened in the women's race while we were talking about the men. Liz Cullen has broken off the uh, front and she has dropped Andrea Duke. It's about a 250 meter gap as we're talking. Duke yeah, is still on that grisly 12% grade. And I think, and she's still losing time. Oh, of course, she'll keep losing time. We won't really know the true gap until uh, Duke gets back onto the descent and we can start seeing what the real distance is. But right. that's a huge change in the women's race. Oh, the Paderberg takes no prisoners. Pad. That's for sure. Yes. They are running through this valley and they are getting shelled. Colton uh, doing men's about race. three watts per kilo over there on the way up. I mean, those are those are pretty serious numbers. That's an impressive average number to be able to hold on the way up. See our cat four men averaging, uh, well, most guys struggling to hit that three watts per kilo. These guys doing about two and a half up at the front. And now, right. just as I say that, of course, they go into the red zone. Thanks, guys. <laughs> well, they've hit another one of these little lumpy, bumpy climbs that uh, peppers this course. It's a true representation of the uh, real Belgian roads, I'd say. So we're about, That's amazing uh, how realistic with... these are. Yeah. So it looks like we're about halfway through the second lap for the men, so they'll have uh, roughly two and a half laps to go, I think. And they're on the descent. And Alfred's may be able to get back into this. He can see the lead two riders only about 40 meters ahead of him right now. And he's definitely putting in the effort. Draft Graph is trying to tell Alfred's how to get up to his competitors there. Walker and Arkang still in the lead. Walker and Arkang are together. I'm afraid our other two riders, On and Aitken, are well off the back now. Uh, they've fallen almost a kilometer away. Uh, maybe they should join up and work together for a while. Yeah, it looks like they're both solo right now. On at 713 meters back and then Aitken at 1.1 kilometers back. So... They're uh, pretty far apart. Here's on, and then back to Aiken. They might get there. Mm -hmm. Aiken's only got I mean, 400 well, meters to make up to on. Yeah, it could happen, could happen. It looks like Alfred's is continuing to close that gap. Um, he's getting closer and closer to our lead riders. There's our King and Walker. As oh, the camera pivots right around, here. look at that. Alfred's We're going to see the catch rider. The, uh, the numbers that he's been putting up today have been really, really strong. But the way that he's sort of come off the group and been, been able to get back on tells me that he probably needs a little more experience on RGT. Could probably uh, use a little more practice on the platform. But it looks like the numbers are there. He's just uh, working out the physics right now, trying to figure out the game, as most people do. It takes a lot of people, uh, several races, until they really feel comfortable with how to stay in a group, ride in a group. Just like real life, you got to learn how to draft. Yeah, I noticed as he crests this climb that he was sort of peaking out around two and a half watts per kilogram on the second half of the slope, while Walker and Arcane were more like three and a half watts per kilo, and I think that's the difference. So let's see if he's clawing some distance back as they come over the top and on the descent. And it almost looks like Walker and Arcane here are uh, sort of working together to try to keep him out, which tactically, I think... Since there's no real worry about a peloton behind them, I think that's probably the best play here. He's definitely got some some serious power, and they would have seen that when he was in the group. And so if I'm uh, these front two, I would say try and keep Alfreds out of this one. Yeah, absolutely. Working together, always better to have a race of two than a race of three when you get close to the finish. And the first two have hit the descent, but Alfred's is still climbing. So we'll see the gap expand, and then we'll start to see if Alfred's can bring back some time on this next descent. Saw Alfred's putting an effort on the way down last time. He was going into, like, the orange zone. And it looks like these guys doing a little bit of power on the way down. Arcane with Perhaps right they've been listening to us, Brad. Kilo. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Although I don't know if taking advice from us is the best uh, <laughs> best way to go about this why well, i've won a few races in my time brad and the last time i won a race was on the track i uh, i won a victory by default after all the other riders made a travesty of the sport according to the officials <laughs> it's a sad but true story uh, the other beauty of rgt is you can set up your own race and be the only person in it and win so i guess i can say i've won some races on rgt with one entry <laughs> 
done just enough virtual racing to find it very humbling. That's right. All right, Duke and Cullen still within striking distance of each other. Uh, it was about 350 meters for Duke back here, although uh, I think Cullen is pretty consistently putting out higher numbers in the watts per kilo category. So unless Duke can redouble her efforts, this number is probably going to continue to grow. 450, 460, going up to 500 meters now between Duke and Cullen. Oh, now look, Duke's got to worry about what's behind her as well, because uh, lean at 730 meters back should be coming within view of Duke here. In fact, there she is. You can see Duke just up the road here for lean. So uh, all of a sudden, Duke's got to worry about what's uh, on her six instead of what's up ahead. Well, worry or work, because I think that the winning move might be here for Andrea Duke and, uh, uh, and rider lean to... Uh, work together. Maybe if they can get their draft going, they can start to put some time on Liz Cullen. Yep. That's I would think Duke Siska would be Lee. More, than, more than happy to let Siska Lean uh, get in there. All three of these, of course, are uh, local riders. Uh, Liz Cullen is from uh, Gibsons, BC, one of the uh, lovely small Gulf Islands just off the uh, coast of Vancouver. So she's Sounds participating like a nice place to ride virtually. Your bike. Oh, it's uh, actually it is. It's all of the Gulf Islands are fantastic places. Uh, the nice thing for her in this case is that uh, she doesn't have to take a ferry over to the mainland in order to do some bike racing. <laughs> and now we're back. We can see Walker and Arkang are still together, and it looks like they've dropped Alfred's again. So he continues to rubber band oh. in and out of that field. Man. I'm amazed that he's been able to get back on so much. I mean, usually you see like maybe once or twice a rider can get back up into the group, and then if they're dropped, they're dropped for good. But Alfred's just about every lap has been fighting back here, and uh, they're going to be looking at two to go when they get up here. Although Alfred's really starting to struggle now. You saw him go into the blue zone. That is uh, one of the lower power zones, so maybe looking for any rest that he can get here on the way up. Still holding these guys under 100 meters. Oh. Oh, this is Walker. Oh, Sorry. So they're picking up a lapped rider here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I think that uh, Alfred's is using the rocky philosophy of uh, bike racing here. It's not how many times you get knocked off the back. It's how many times you get back on. Right. RGT Meanwhile, just added okay. it. A, a, uh, an elimination mode to the game where uh, the riders, you can jump on with your friends, you get five or ten people together, last rider each lap gets eliminated from the game. That would not be a good one for Alfreds to play right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, in no indeed it wouldn't. That, that's a super fun race format, uh, both uh, in real life for sure, so I'm sure it's a lot of fun on the virtual mode too. Oh, and it looks like Liz Cullen is being shown to us because she has finally gapped uh, Andrea Duke. Well, no, sorry. She's had her gapped for a while, but are we going to see Siska and Andrea starting to work together? They seem to be getting closer, although they're both getting pretty far from Liz at this point. Yeah, I think that number might be a little, uh, little inflated between Duke and Lean because Duke is on the climb. I don't think Lean has made it there yet. Showing oh, okay. 430, 450 meters. Yeah, here's Lean on the way up to the climb. So, All right, so we're about we'll to get see a, him get as close as they get. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll get a, a better view of what that gap is or a better better idea of that time check here. Yeah, it's probably going to be about the, the length of the climb. Yeah, that's what it's looking like. And we can see uh, Liz Cullen just cresting the climb now on one of our displays and Duke about halfway up and Siska Lean has just entered the bottom of the uh, climb. I'm going to have to add, check with Liz Cullen whether she's any relationship to Jake Cullen, a local amateur who's a pretty strong rider in his own right. But it's a common name, might not be right. Although cycling powerhouse families are pretty common as well <laughs> in the sport I find, so I would not be surprised. Yeah, definitely. I think we've got a few uh, parents and children uh, participating this weekend. 
So Liz Cullen continues to power away. She's got half a kilometer on her rivals. This is looking like a race that might be in the bag as she's well past the halfway mark and showing no signs of flagging. Yeah, and Andrea Cullen Duke knows it too. <laughs> you think she's easing up a little bit? Yeah, I, I'm watching her power. Uh, her average has been like 3.2, 3.3. She's at 3 right now, but she's she's spending a lot more time in the lower zones, in the green zones. Yeah, see, she's green right now. I think normally she was riding in like the yellow or orange zone on these flatter sections just at uh, at the top of the Paderberg there. So, And uh, you can see the gap that she's looking at 700, 800 meters behind. She should be feeling pretty good about this. Nine kilometers to go. That'll be uh, two laps next time through. What's the... Uh, uh, sorry, 7.7 7 kilometers to go. The uh, nine is showing what, the distance covered. What's the pro uh, theory that you can regain about 10 seconds per kilometer? I yeah. I think that we might... Yep. I think we might be closing no. on the unclosable gap here if yeah. uh, Duke and Lean don't work together and get back on this pretty quick. Look at this, 17% grade on the way up for Duke here. You can see it on our GT, you can see it in the power numbers, and uh, you can see it on the slope there up in the top right. The uh, graph that you see there really isn't an exaggeration. I mean, it's, uh, it is incredibly steep. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen the videos of people trying to get up these. It pretty much feels the same on a trainer, on our GT. I mean, it feels like there's something wrong with the thing, like you might have broken it because you're really having trouble turning those pedals over. I just saw a peak out of 20% slope as Siska Lean was riding up this wall. I don't even want to do that virtually, never mind in real life. Yeah. But Cullen continues to power away at the front. Lean and Duke are getting closer, but that might be effect an effect of both of them being on the hill. So we'll get a better idea of the true gap once they roll over the top. It might be time for them to work together. This is sort of getting to a crux point in this women's race. Cullen rapidly riding out of into the distance and Lean and Duke really needing, I think, now to work together if they're going to have any chance of reeling back the very strong Liz Cullen. Yeah, see, it shows Lean at 100 meters back right now, but that's because uh, she is just on the climb while Duke has gone up and over the climb. So you'll see that number grow, and I think when it maxes out, that's going to be our realistic gap here. So Lean getting to the top here, let's say 100... 70, 180 meters, where is it going to stop? Maybe 200. Mm -hmm. But I see That's Duke probably... is doing a lot of resting. One, 1. 1.2, 1. 1.5 watts per kilo. And this is easy spin on the descent. Maybe she's waiting for her lean. Hard to say for sure, but we will find out on the descent whether these two can get together. Yeah, it might also be that Duke... That's still a long way to go. If you're, if you're feeling really good, maybe you're thinking, like, I can get back up to Colin. But if you're not feeling good, you're looking at this like 8.1K. Oh, boy. I would sure love a little <laughs> bit of help in here. I guess the game theory for, for Duke is whether or not she can stay away. I mean, she doesn't have to do much work in order to more or less lock up second place. But if she has ambitions for first, the I fear the only way it's going to happen now is if she works with uh, the Siska coming up from behind. Hopefully, we'll get a rematch of these riders in uh, our next stops of the Virtual BC Cup. Uh, next weekend, April 10th, is stop number two. Then next one on April 17th, take a week off. And then the fourth stop of the Virtual BC Cup, May 1st, to uh, wrap up this sort of virtual series. Ryan, talk to me a little bit about uh, the BC Cup, about Cycling BC, sort of how this virtual race came together. And I guess what it's replacing in real life. I mean, uh, where you guys would normally be in a quote unquote normal year with uh, racing up in BC? Well, that's an excellent question. We've got to credit Matt Osborne, who I think has been a real proponent of the RGT platform and a virtual racing in general. He's also a strong wheel as much as I tease him on, on the uh, roads. At this time of year, it being uh, early April, we would have in a real year uh, just completed the uh, spring series put on by my own favorite club, my club, uh, Escape Velocity Cycling Club. Uh, this is a springtime, mostly March-based um, series where we go out into the Fraser Valley, just outside of Vancouver proper, 
and uh, race on some of the more rural roads out there. Lovely courses ranging from about 8 to 16 kilometers. Very reminiscent of sort of classic Kermass and road circuit courses that you would see in Europe. Um, this is the point in the year where we'd start to get into some other classic races like Jeremy's Roubaix, a race that in various versions has run uh, for years out in Pitt Meadows. And that event is, uh, features a half gravel course. Way before gravel cycling was cool, <laughs> we were racing on the gravel dikes there around the Pitt Meadows airport. And finally, this would be the time of year when we would be closing on the start of the World Tuesday Night Championships, but I can tell you that those midweek Tuesday night races, we are hoping very much that we will be able to run some version of them later in the year, so watch this space. Yeah. And We're getting there. My, We're starting to see little peaks of sunshine on the horizon for, for getting back to racing pretty soon here. At least in North America, I know they've uh, had some high-level races that uh, they've been able to get underway in Europe, but hopefully we, we, uh, we keep masking up, we keep our distance, we get our shots, we'll be back to racing sooner rather than later. But uh, Cycling BC, it, it sounds like there's a, a decent bit of racing up there, not just road racing. I was poking around uh, a little bit. A uh, lot of opportunities for riders to race up there. In uh, Do you guys call it the Pacific Northwest? Is it incorrect to call it Pacific Northwest? As an American, you know, I'm sort of ignorant to the rest of the world. So <laughs> is it is it uh, accurate to say Pacific Northwest in Canada as well? I think it's certainly the, the locals are... <laughs> you see, it's the Pacific Southeast for us, of course. No, uh, the locals would certainly answer to the uh, Pacific Northwest, okay. uh, along with other things like Cascadia, the, the homegrown term for sort of the Oregon, uh, Washington, British Columbia region. Um, yeah, we have a lot of racing in British Columbia, and I'm, I'm perhaps emphasizing too much the, uh, the work I'm most familiar with in the, what we call the Lower Mainland, the Greater Vancouver area. Uh, there's fantastic organizers and organizations on the island of Vancouver and also in the interior, as we call it, Kamloops, Kelowna, those areas where there's some really great races. One of the big misses from the schedule is I know my, my close personal friend Mark Ernsting had to uh, cancel what we call Super Week each year, which is a uh, July week of pro racing where we'll see some of the uh, continental teams uh, send their riders in and the... Uh, two centerpiece events of that uh, week of racing are of course the uh, Tour de Delta which is actually a UCI rated race and the uh, ever popular Gastown Grand Prix. So, uh, Gastown is a fantastic history. Um, it's been going so long and with such prestige that you've even heard the names of some of the past riders including a uh, then very young Lance Armstrong. Uh, it was one of the greatest wins he ever got in his career. You know, of course, he went over to France many times, but never won a Tour de France. Uh, <laughs> Still holding on to those uh, <laughs> those uh, BC Super Week victories. You got to take what you can get. Yes, it's uh, yeah, right. a, a legendary uh, legendary week of racing, I guess, in uh, in BC Super Week. It's uh, yeah, one that uh, I think every North American rider looks forward to every year. Yeah, it's uh, some, some fantastic stuff, and they're great street events. But I think that there was just no appetite, of course, for this year for having a, a large event that practically encourages large crowds. Yeah. But we will enjoy the virtual racing until we can get back to the non-virtual form. And where have we got, you know, is it just me, or is uh, Duke beginning to close a little bit on, uh, on Liz Cullen, or are we maybe just seeing another rubber band effect from the hills? I think there's a little bit of rubber band effect here. Oh, it's 1.6K. Oh. I thought that's at 160 <laughs> meters. I was I was right yeah. there with you. I was... Never yeah. mind. <laughs> so so it's Duke and Lean that are linking up. I guess still going to be closer together here at uh, about 220 meters, looks like, between those two. So, yeah, Cullen is dominating here. This is her race. Uh, she, can, she can afford to chill here. She can even afford a little... Uh, Technical, a virtual mechanical, if you will. You can reset the router. She's got enough time. <laughs> yeah, we're we're seeing we're seeing uh, Duke uh, here on the chase, but I think that this has become a one-two-three race, and barring a virtual mechanical, that may be how the women's race ends up here. With, uh, lean now about four hundred meters back, and oh. there we are. So it's oh, just it looks big so gaps painful. forming. This is such a selective course, I feel like that was always in the cards that uh, 
there's only so many times you can go up and down these hills, whether they're real or virtual, uh, without uh, shredding each other. That's a good point. We talked about the first time riders, the new riders to RGT. Paderberg is a very difficult course to start learning the platform on because there's so much ebb and flow of the tempo. You have to modulate your power so much on this course in order to, to stay in. A flatter course would be a lot easier for riders to sort of stay with the group. It's a lot easier to gently figure out the physics. This one, you're like up and down, left and right. You got to understand the turns. You got to understand the climb. But by the way, talking about the turns, they do affect the riders if you pedal through the turns on this course you're basically wasting power the game won't register your power as you're going into the turn it doesn't open the power back up until you hit the apex of uh, of a turn so uh, the riders want to coast on the way in and you'll see them uh, coasting on the avatar when obviously when they have a lower pow power input just like the riders standing up it uh, also shows the avatar coasting when they zero out or get close to zeroing out their power meter so you have to let off the gas on the way through the turn otherwise you'll be punished uh, on uh, on the the physics of the game it's uh, another thing that you learn pretty quickly when you're going through a turn with another rider and all of a sudden on the other side of the turn you're not with the other rider oh it's fascinating uh, maybe i can up my virtual game by incorporating this knowledge about how the turns work that's good Meanwhile, as we drop back to the uh, Cat 4 men's race, it looks like we have a similar race situation. Our King and Walker are 1-2, and Alfred's is about 1.6 kilometers back. And Jake, or is that Jake? But Aiken is uh, further back yet. So we'll try to give a proper first name to Aiken, but I'm not seeing him on my start list, so I'm just deeply confused at this point. Jimmy R. Kang is uh, one of our two leaders here. He's from Alexandria, Virginia, which is probably not that far from Pennsylvania. I'm not really sure how, the, how America works, Brad. <laughs> it's all the same. It's like Canada, you know? It's just one big blob of guns and hot dogs. <laughs> ah, guns and hot dogs. Two of my favorite things there, Brad. Ah. Reasonable opinions may differ. Getting back to the racing, what have we got here? Our Kangan Walker still going hammer and tongs. It'd be interesting to see what the tactics are because we're now at the one and a half kilometers to go mark. These guys are getting into sprint territory. And it yeah, looks like they're I, both coasting. So This is a tough one. I mean, I don't think either one of these riders would know, you know, if they're a good sprinter on RGT. Everyone knows if they're a good sprinter in real life, but RGT is a whole different world when it comes to a sprint. So... I don't know what the strategy is here. I don't know if you, you try and attack early at like 800 meters, try and get a gap and hold on, or you just kind of sit on and try and sprint it out. It'll be interesting to see how these two guys uh, duke it out here in 1,000 meters from now as uh, they go inside 1K. That's right. We've passed the virtual red kite as we come to this virtual finish. But the very real leader at the moment is our Kang, but basically he's just giving a lead out to Walker be interesting to see how tactical they are, whether there's any drop in power, whether there's any attempt to pick up a draft and attack. Uh, do you know, Brad, how much of, uh, you know, sort of Russian and, uh, and other sort of subtleties of drafting are well modeled in the game? Do you see that happening? Well, they're, yeah. they're about to hit a climb. Yeah, and e even the incline of the course will affect the draft. So you're going to see a lower draft, obviously, at lower speeds or on an uphill section of the climb. So, uh, yeah, at this point, the race to the top of the Paderberg, I guess we were thinking about it as a flat sprint, but uh, the drafting really not going to matter here. This is really going to be all about power. As Walker gets to it early, uh, he's just going to try and power this one from the bottom, going into the red zone at 430 meters to go. Now, this is going to be the longest 430 meters of these guys' lives on the way up to the top of this climb. Walker getting a nice gap going here. Our Kang trying to hold on. And the gap continues to grow. Right. Walker's numbers have been peaking over five watts per kilogram, so he is yeah. leaving it all on this hill. Yeah, I think that's the highest that we've seen him all day. Our Kang trying not to blow up. Look at him dropping down into the orange zone. He's like, I can't stay red this entire climb. Walker had to drop down a little bit as well. Our Kang may be Unless playing a Kang long game here. Unless Walker is bluffing, I think that might be the race. Walker still maintaining yep. over four watts per kilogram, though, so Oof. 300 meters to go, but it's going to be a long 300 meters. 
Yeah, looks to me like Walker's just got more wattage left in the tank. Uh, the average number just to the right of his name is consistently just a little higher than our Kang on the way up here. So it's only 30 meters for our Kang, though. Got to give him some credit here. Hanging on. Oh, no. And he's hung on on this climb every time. So he's been close competition for Walker the whole way, but I fear that his race is disappearing into the distance here. Yeah, he's going to run out of room at uh, 220 meters to go now for our Kang. That means Walker inside 200. So Ian Walker is our leader. He's actually a member of the uh, Lake City Cycling Club, which I know very well because they're based mere, a mere kilometer or so from where I sit right now. Uh, lovely Lake City, as beautiful as it sounds, is actually an industrial park, which... Uh, <laughs> features many lovely local businesses and some fairly wide roads, as well as one of my favorite breweries in the whole darned world. And Walker is inside of 100 meters to the finish. He can see the banner. He's chased there by our Kang, but there is going to be no doubt about the victory here. Nice. Our Solo very good through the line. The <laughs> Our Kang approaches the line. He's done a credible job on this day, and he will get a well-deserved second place. As he rolls through, he knows this is no longer in doubt, and you can see he's already on his cooldown. And then we're going to have a short wait before we see Alfred's come to the finish as well. I was really impressed with our Kang and Walker today riding together uh, in our Cap 4 men's race. Pretty impressive to be able to do that uh, for that long and that consistently for those two. So uh, they played the game really well on our GT. It was fun watching those two guys up at the front. So you see yeah, third place on the way in for our Cap 4 men as we pick up the front of our women's field with Cullen continuing to dominate here. And uh, her gap has grown even more as she is now on her final way up the Paderberg climb. 300 meters. She's got a hard climb here, but it is a parade lap for her she is not going to get caught with the three kilometer gap yeah and no reason to go into the red zone here i wouldn't be there either <laughs> you got a two and a half kilometer lead enjoy the ride enjoy the way up that's right get some of this beautiful virtual scenery and this yeah lovely virtual weather it's being cheered on by those great virtual fans they're always enthusiastic it's because they're programmed to be that's right. They don't have they a don't. choice. The the <laughs> uh, it's actually cool for the riders on the platform. You hear the cheering as you go by. There's like cowbells and claps and you know cheers and stuff like that. And it kind of has the Doppler effect as you go by. It gets louder and quieter as you're passing these sort of groups of riders out on course. So it is kind of realistic for the riders that are uh, that are playing with their screen app. Oh, that's that's just superb. Who needs real fans with virtualization yeah. like that? Exactly. So we're watching Liz. She is at the 140 meter mark. She's just about to come over the top and do her quick little run into the finish. Duke is still suffering it out on the climb. You can see her uh, wattage. Actually, with that wattage, she must be just at the bottom of the climb, and that's what I'm seeing now on the other graph. Yeah. But let's watch as Liz Cullen takes the victory. Bravo, Beautiful. Liz. Now we will wait. It's not much of a battle, but we've still got Duke and Siskeline, but we're now seeing that I think uh, Alfred's is approaching his finish as well. Yep. Oh no, wait, Alfred's is done, but it would be, oh no, it is Alfred's no, I, still yeah. on the course in third place. And he's being chased down by Aitken, but again, I think this is going to be a pretty decided finish at this point. You're gonna have to build some paper boy tactics into this one for uh... <laughs> for some of these steeper parts of the Paderberg. Yeah, we'll have to see if they uh, incorporate walk mode into the, yeah. <laughs> into the simulator. But Alfred's is there. He's being cheered on. I'm sure he's enjoying all of the uh, beautiful scenery as he cranks out a nice solid 2.7 watts per kilo. Uh, once again, he's got a big gap. Everybody ahead of him is already finished. Aitken is a good kilometer behind him, so he can just... Relax, enjoy this very pleasant virtual 18% slope he's on, 
and in 200 meters, his suffering will be over for the day. This is a good chance to kind of ramp it down a little bit. Uh, my big issue on the trainer, you go really deep, and then if you just stop, you're going to want a bucket nearby. So uh, <laughs> I guess I would also pass some advice along to these riders finishing on the Paderberg to maybe ride it out a little bit after you finish. Just keep the legs spinning because yeah. otherwise it could get messy in the pain cave. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like one of the real dangers of the trainer is that you do have the ability to go deep without paying much attention to the world because you don't actually have to be able to ride your bike uh, in order to suffer maximally. So you don't have that constraint on how deep an effort you go for. And for me personally, what I've really liked about the virtuals training is it just scratches that itch of competition and gives you someone to chase in a way that you don't get when you're just riding a trainer without some sort of virtual environment in front of you. I think the, the ability to do a virtual ride together, I think is really, really cool. Uh, you know, when you have people all over the country, all over the world, be able to jump on for an hour, you know, play together, chat, communicate, ride together, get a little workout in. And yeah, have that just little bit of chasing, you know, the town line sprints, right? That we've all missed from, uh, from our group rides or whatever you've missed or wherever you get that competition from, whether it's racing to the next light, trying to be first in line at the ice cream shop after the ride, you know, everyone Everyone has something that uh, that they look for a little bit of competition in. So, yeah, it's uh, it's really cool to be able to race and ride on these platforms. Whether it's Zwift, RGT, uh, Be Cool, Rovi, there's a, a whole suite of uh, of these different platforms that you can race on. They all have their own unique thing. They all have their own sort of hook. For RGT, it's uh, the real roads. It's the ability to upload real courses and uh, and race on these sort of realistic worlds. Like the Paderberg we're racing on now, this is uh, pretty much uh, an accurate representation of what, what the Paderberg section looks like down to this house that uh, I think we're looking at uh, Aiken racing by right now on the right-hand side. It's uh, They have modeled this part of the climb realistic. There's a few of these that uh, go throughout the world that we're going to be racing on. Uh, I know we're going to be racing Canary Wharf as part of the BC Cup and then the uh, Dirty Reaver course is uh, a, a gravel-based course that uh, we'll be racing on as well for the third stop. And then fourth stop is TBD. I think they're going to wait to see how uh, these first three sort of play out. They're very different courses. The Paderberg is like this up and down, very Belgian climb. Canary Wharf is more like a flat Criterium-style course. And then the Dirty Reaver is going to be uh, more similar to a road race course, a longer, more open, sort of rolling hill climb for uh, the third stop of the Virtual BC Cup. And then I guess whichever one's most fun, they'll do for the fourth stop. So it'll be interesting to see how these three very different courses play out uh, over the next three weeks. So it looks like as uh, we watch the closing moments of this race, we've got Andrea Duke now on the climb and only 300 very steep meters from her finish. And on the other side, we've got Aiken. He is also... Closing rapidly. He's only about 380 meters as well. So it's funny, but these, uh, but we've got Duke and Aiken sort of virtually on the same part of the course at the same time. Yeah, yeah so they're, they're in not really two racing different, each other. Right, they're in different virtual <laughs> worlds right now. They're in the same virtual world in two different instances, I guess. So they won't see each other out there on course. We are uh, running right. these races at the same time, but they're in different virtual worlds, so uh, there's no mixing between the categories. Thanks to the magic of the uh, virtual racing, there will be no preemption of the women's race by, for the men's That's finish right. or any such thing. That's right. So Aiken will be our final finisher in the Cat 4 men. He's only 170 meters now from that finish. I'm torn on the finish that goes just past the top of the climb. Part of me thinks that it should be like right here where you get off the cobbles at the true top of the climb. But the little extra paved section when you get to the top actually makes for some pretty interesting finishes when uh, when you have small groups together. I think Aiken thought he just hit the line there. <laughs> Sorry. I think, he, I think he thought he was done at the top. But yeah, it goes another 120 meters you see here. Just Sorry, Jonathan, you got to put in a little more effort. <laughs> he races for the Lotus Cycling Club locally, another fairly new team, um, but they've been around for, I think, a couple of years now. Although I don't know if play gears count when you're talking about things like how many seasons we're just wiping, done. No, we're just wiping it out. The last year didn't happen. 
that's right. Man, it is a good thing we don't have uh, post-ups on RGT. That, uh, especially on this course, that could lead to some <laughs> early celebrations that resulted in lost races. Nice job by Aiken out there today, though. All right, yes, congratulations to all our uh, men. And now we go back to the open women's race, and it looks like we've got Andrea Duke still on the course. And we've got Siska Lean chasing her down. It is only a 70-meter gap, but I'm pretty confident that that gap will not be closed because that 70 meters includes some very, very steep climbing. I think that our friend Siska from Vancouver is going to be content with third place, and it'll be Andrea Duke. She's only moments away from taking this second place position for the Mariloma Cycling Club. Great job by uh, Duke and Lean today out there as well. Uh, for Lean, who's been trying to catch up to Duke all day, a lot of riders will get discouraged when they've been chasing all day. They're coming up on, let's say, 30-plus minutes of chasing here for Lean, trying to hold on to Duke. It is really easy to let this gap go rapidly over 200 meters once uh, you know, you've tried to chase on four or five times and it hasn't worked out. So a uh, really impressive ride by, uh, by Lean out there today to hold on to this one and at least try and keep it to uh, a manageable distance where uh, she could at least see Duke on some of the parts of the course today. This is one of the hardest things to do. I mean, riding on the trainer is tough. It, it, not that you would know, but when you get dropped out of a race, you're all by yourself. Uh, just <laughs> willing yourself to keep going on, sometimes because you're stuck out there in the middle of nowhere and you just have to get back to the finish line to get back to your car. But sometimes uh, once you lose that contact, it's, it's really tough to keep that motivation. So Lean has done a nice job of that today. You may have some experience of getting dropped. <laughs> I heard you got dropped once. Well, uh, the uh, the archives at Cycling BC re revealed some deep secrets of your past racing. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, congratulations to Siska Lean. I believe she is our final finisher in this first pair of races. Nice work by all the riders. In the uh, women's race, we saw an early breakaway, I think, by Liz Cullen, and she made it stick. And on the men's side, we've got Ian Walker gapping Jimmy R. Kang on the last climb after a hammer and tongs set of racing all through those four laps. Yeah, that was a four great climbs battle. Four climbs the paper. Up up. Walker and R. Kang really duking it out for most of the day today. I'm noticing Walker averages a 3.49 watts per kilogram, or Kang at 3.12. I think that was probably the difference on that Paderberg climb today for the Category 4 man. I mean, that's where you need that extra 0.3 watts per kilogram for our Kang to be able to hang with Walker. Yeah, and when you don't have it, it's there's no yeah. getting it. Shane because Alfred it really seemed Jonathan. like a... I was going to say our Kang was, was able to stay on the flats, but it was on the Paderberg, on the climb, where uh, Ian Walker really dominated today in the Cat Force. Yeah, for sure. Alfred Zanakin made uh, credible um, showings. Uh, Alfred's taking the third place, and Jonathan hanging on for a good workout today. So, Well done to all four of our racers. So we've got a little bit of time. It looks like we'll be starting our next race at 9.30. Is that right, Brad? Uh, correct. So looking at our Category 2 and Category 3 men coming up at 9.30, about 12 minutes from now. As we take a look at our women's open results, Liz Cullen ended the day at 38.22 for an average 3.16 watts per kilogram. Wow, big numbers from this field. Andrea Duke at 45 minutes doing 2.24 average. And then Siska Lean, who we watched finish up just a little bit ago at 2.39. So you can see uh, Lean had a higher watts per kilogram than Duke, but ended up in third behind Duke. That's because Duke was riding with Liz Cullen for a part of the day today. And so she was able to save uh, enough energy to lower her average watts per kilogram while she was drafting off of Liz Cullen. Siska Lean spent most of the day alone by herself, so she didn't get that, uh, that drafting advantage advantage to lower her average watts per kilo out there. So that explains the difference, I guess, in uh, average power between second and third place there and why second place would have a lower average than third place. Really all comes down to drafting and uh, efficiency of riding throughout the day. So it's not all about the power numbers, just like in real life, got to race your bike as well.
It's great to see that sort of uh, tactical detail incorporated into the virtual racing, right? Uh, and, and the nicest part about having those numbers right there in front of you at the end of the race is that you can relive this experience of regretting it for the entire week until the <laughs> next event. You got a week to either train or dread the next week coming up. <laughs> uh, I guess it depends on how you look at things. Uh, I know a lot of riders though will be looking to just improve on their results over these uh, over these four days of racing uh, over five weeks. So it'll be interesting to watch some of these names sort of advance and progress in the in the uh, in the game over the next few minutes here. So looks like we are just about 10 minutes out from our next race here. So, uh, Ryan, let's take a quick break here as we get ready for our Category 2 and 3s coming up at 9.30 a.m. How's that sound? Sounds good to me, so I'll see you in a few moments.
And welcome back to the virtual BC Cup presented by Cobotics as we get ready for our second race of the day. Just wrapped up our Category 4 men and open women. Now getting ready for Category 2s and 3s up next with a 9.30 local start time. Just about five and a half minutes away from rolling those riders out onto course. Going to be doing six laps of our virtual course on RGT today. Let's bring back in Ryan Cousineau. Ryan, uh, after your first RGT race of the day today, uh, what are you looking forward to in uh, in our next race? I mean, what did you learn from that first race today? Well, it was super exciting to see how the Paderberg was animating the course. It'll be really interesting to see how this next group of riders, our Cat 2 and Cat 3 fields, will confront all of the virtual elements of uh, bike racing. And on this particular course, the Paderberg, it's definitely going to mean how are they going to deal with a hill that peaks out at a 20% grade? Yeah, we saw some uh, pretty significant separation in uh, our first round of racing on the Paderberg. We saw a lot of riders that were able to hang on the flats, but when they got to that Paderberg section, lap after lap after lap, they get dropped. And uh, again, not that you would know, but you don't want to be yo-yoing back and forth off the back in a race like this. No, of course. I would know nothing about yo-yoing off the back of a race with a steep climb in it. That is, never happened to me. <laughs> Looks like we're going to have a slightly uh, deeper field for these Cat 3s and 4s. I'm seeing some names that I recognize. One person I want to call out is there's a <clears throat> Category 2 racer named Brad Issel in this event who uh, has past experience with a bike racing club called Symmetrics. Had a former teammate on Symmetrics named Swain Tuft. I'm thinking Brad might still be good at bike racing. Just a thought. I mean, he's old now, <laughs> but he's not that old. I, a lot can change in retirement, but I don't think you ever, you ever quite fully lose your Symmetrics form from the <clears throat> Symmetrics <throat> years, however long ago that was. <laughs> Uh, Symmetrics, a, a great local success story in bike racing. Uh, they they even had their own comic book at one point. That is a true story. I have a copy. It's amazing. That's cool. Very cool. <laughs> it's amazing so uh, how important those teams are, how important those uh, teams become. And uh, I say that because I know that's a big part of why Cycling BC wanted to do these races, to give more riders an opportunity to get noticed, to get showcased, to go race on those bigger teams. This is certainly a good place to show off your power numbers if you have those impressive numbers and so uh, hopefully we'll be able to showcase some of these canadian and bc athletes a little better in uh, the virtual bc cup here yeah absolutely so we're only about two and a half minutes from the start it'll be uh, separate fields for our category two and category three men here uh, it'll be exciting to see uh, i see a lot of big names not just brad issel in both fields I'm looking forward to seeing young Luke Hubner, who will also be racing in the Category 2s. I was watching him uh, race track uh, in 2019, and he showed himself very well in that field. Um, many other good local riders. These are both pretty solid fields. In the Category 3s, I'm a little less familiar with the uh, folks that we've got on the line. Although I do see Sean Griffard there in the uh, Cat 3 field. I know his mom is very proud of him. That's because she told me yesterday. That's because I used to work with Susan Griffard uh, at a local community college. And uh, so we're very excited to see how her boy does. Good luck, son. That's cool. <laughs> so these riders, uh, the categories that they're racing on on RGT pretty well line up to how they race in real life. Uh, it's based on your FTP and your category in real life as to which uh, which group they put them in here. So most of these riders in a Cat 2 will have uh, a, an FTP somewhere over 3 watts per kilogram. And then the riders in the Cat 3 usually do somewhere between 2.5 and, and 3 watts per kilogram as their FTP. So And then uh, it, it's based on priority, the, the ranking system. That they have your real life category is the first priority your second priority is your ftp and then your third uh, priority would be your category on other racing platforms like zwift so they take uh, your real life license first and then if it's maybe not a good fit on the virtual platform you can look at uh, at your ftp to see if you're a better fit for a category up or a category down make sure you're not uh, a sandbagger or whatever they call a reverse sandbagger mm -hmm. 
So it looks like we're 45 seconds to the start of this race. All the riders are lined up. Let's see if we start to see some of their uh, power numbers uh, begin to blip up as these riders yeah. ramp up for the flying start. I'm I was going to sure say, you'll be able both... to... Go ahead. All right. I'm sure that in both fields we'll see, uh, we'll see that attempt to make a quick selection into the haves and the have-nots when it comes to living in the wattage cottage. But as we're about 15 seconds to go, I'll turn it over to you, Brad, to call this start. You're going to see exactly who has raced on RGT before and who hasn't because the numbers are going to turn red. The power numbers, orange or red, those are the riders that have raced on RGT before because they know how important <laughs> these starts are. The riders that did not get into that uh, orange-red power zone at the start, those are going to be the newcomers to RGT. Welcome to virtual racing. You've been dropped, and it's only seven seconds in. What a time to be alive. Ah, and the selection is fast and furious here. Yeah. You can see both fields going off like a shot. We've got some of the riders getting up into the lead, but they're keeping it for only fractions of a second. Everybody's trying to be in that lead group. Barely any point in calling the action until we actually finally see a selection happen. They're just going to go red line and hurt themselves for yep. about another minute and a half. All for <laughs> our entertainment, Brad. Pretty much, pretty be pretty a... accurate uh, description of what we're watching here. There's really two selections. There's there's an initial selection when they leave the line. They're the, they're the haves and have-nots that can figure out how that start works on RGT. If you miss that, good chance you don't catch back on. And then there's a second selection that happens like in the first 10 or 15 minutes after they sort of settle down a little bit and decide on uh, the, the watts per kilo that they're going to be pushing or the power that they're going to be pushing in the group. That's when the second selection comes and you start to see riders slow getting popped off the back of the group. So if you're in this group right now, if you've made the front group in either of these two races, you're halfway there. You're halfway to finishing in the main group today. Yeah, we're looking now at the Category 2 men, and you can see that it looks like the selection has probably happened somewhere between 18th and 19th place, if my numbers are accurate. It looks yeah. like we're going to have this lead group of just under 20 that will, if things don't change for the back group very quickly, that will be the decider, but I don't think we've got yep. too many dropped riders um, in a field that's got only about uh, 22 riders if we discount the uh, virtual camera there. And I see, ah, uh, oh, my poor, my old friend Y Ben Wong has been left at the start or something. Not sure whether oh, no. he had a technical difficulty or what. Yeah. Y Ben's a fine young man, however, I do know what he did five summers ago. It's, we've got it all uh -oh. on video, Y Ben. You can't escape your past. Well, maybe he, he heard your voice and left the start line. He, he got a little freaked <laughs> out when when he heard to, hey, that you've got the secrets. Look, yeah, he's showing zero on the power meter, so I think he's probably a, probably a disconnection is my guess. That's a bummer. Uh, tragic mechanical for a guy who could have actually animated this race a bit. I don't think he was in the realm for winning, but uh, why Ben is by no means a, no means a weak rider, although I do like to tease him. So who have we got up at the front here? It looks like, oh, shock, Brad Issel and Luke Hubner are, in fact, <laughs> hovering around the need of, lead of this race. That's uh, watch watch these guys youth. at the back. This is going to be really interesting. Oh. First time up uh, the first sort of big climb of this loop, and you'll start to see guys get dropped off here. Axon is the first casualty of the pace here. Hubner just getting set up on the power here, I think. I don't think this is getting dropped. And Dumper back here trying to hold on. He's going to get up into the group. Dumper missed the group from the start. He was uh, trying to chase back on for when they left the starting line. Axon has been dropped out of the group on the climb here. And it looks like Wieslake is the one driving the pace up here at the front. Oh, boy. <laughs> here we go. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, indeed, yeah. So Jamie Dumper, he's, uh, he's a runner-turned-cyclist, now apparently turned virtual cyclist. But the real action looks like it's West Lake trying to uh, hang, and he's got uh, Giesler uh, beside him for company. And then they're being chased down by Guest, my good friend's, uh, my good friend's son, Sean Griffard, Belanger from, Carl Belanger from out in Quebec, and Ruslan Gadjiev, a local rider for the U-Dog team. Yeah, U-Dog has a fantastic little faceted Husky logo, and I happen to know that at least one of the riders in the uh, pro peloton for today's racing was encouraged by his girlfriend to join Hugh Dog, although he declined to because she thought the logo was so cute. Uh, it's funny you say it's that. Like very... in the, uh... Go ahead. Go ahead. In the Echelon Racing League, they had a merch 
program for all the teams. They had hats and T-shirts and stuff. And uh, Hugh Dog was one of the best selling of uh, of the merch, I think, because of the yeah the very cool Husky logo. That was also my uh, commentary partner Frankie Andre's favorite uh, favorite logo of all the teams. So yeah, Hugh Dog has a good brand going on up there. Yeah. I don't know which graphic designer did that for them, but yeah, it looks as good in person as it uh, does in the in uh, on the screen for sure. But uh, I think that's a um, that's a team that was named after a friend of mine, uh, Steve Hewick. He's still working there, and I hope there I hope Steve is doing well. I don't think he's in the race today, but uh, he serves as both the organizer and the coach of that team. I always wondered you where know. the name Hugh Dog came from, and I think I know now. That's exactly it. So Carl Guest is uh, showing up the, uh, or is that Carl? No, but Mr. Guest is showing up the uh, rest of the field in the Cat 2s. Meanwhile, over on the Cat 3 side, uh, looks like Mark Matthews from Gastown Cycling is at the front of that field. It's a hard-charging group now as they are hitting the climb. It's got to be not a lot of fun for either of these fields because they're both deep into the classic Paderberg climb here. Yeah. Oh, look at Micah Goldberg there trying to hang on. <laughs> that's going to be uh, some hard riding. We see a bit of a gap forming. I think that's uh, Bart Gould who is just on the front of the back, as it were, in the Cat 3 field. Yeah, that is indeed. Bart Gould riding for Steed Cycles. I know him from track, cyclocross, road. He does it all. But Meanwhile, he's got a gap to close. And yeah, Nathan yeah. Weeslake over here in the Cat 2 Men continuing to put the pressure on. I thought uh, he might come back on the climb, but Weeslake attacked at the bottom. And it looks like Geisler, the only rider that can go with him. Wow, big separation early on here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Soren Weeslake, he's a uh, he's a very young rider. That young man is 16 years old, and he finished third overall in the Canadian Junior Virtual Cycling Series for the U-17s. He holds a Manitoba cycling li license, even though he's got a... Uh, so he may be an out-of-towner and come here to score some virtual victory points. Now looking at the Category 3 field, and it looks like we've got uh, Vandegrind on the front. The name like that, you know he's going to be good on these roads. Yeah. <laughs> he is trading, trading the lead with uh, Mark Matthews, I believe that is. Or is it Michael Matthews? We've got both in the local field, so now I'm going to have to look up the start list. Looks like Matthews got the Cycling Canada jersey going. I think that's what that is. Don't you guys have blue with the, the red and black? That is correct. That would be the tasteful colors of the Canadian cycling team, although I'm not going to swear that Mr. Matthews has earned that. But I won't make any uh, you, hard accusations uh, well, until I look it up. Yeah, when you log on to RGT, you can select any team jersey <laughs> they want. I think we saw some riders in a rally jersey maybe in here, uh, I, and then there were also some Canyon eSports jerseys. Uh, yeah, you can ride whatever you want. As long as you, as long as you look possible. cool, that's half the battle. Well, when he's not racing for the virtual Canadian cycling team, uh, that would be uh, Mark Matthews. Wait, no, it is Michael Matthews. Michael Matthews, who races for the storied Gastown Cycling Club. They're a uh, very good local team, well-connected to local cycling, one of the biggest ones in the lower mainland. And now look at Nickerson over here on the right-hand side of the screen. Cat 3 men trying to hold on here, just trying to get up to that group. Come on, Mr. Nickerson. They're so close. It's only 40 meters. This is your race. He's now joined by Chan and Goldberg. Hopefully the three of them can work together and close that 50, 60 meter gap. Because heaven knows they need to. Oh, and I think that's Mike Goodman also uh, in that group in the Cat 3 Men. Goodman is another very good rider. It's not just a joke on his name. Uh, he races for the uh, Glotman Simpson cycling team, as I like to affectionately call them, the Bumblebees, after their classic black, white, and yellow look. And he's racing in an all-black jersey today, like some sort of Michael Rasmussen imitator. <laughs> we got to get the Bumblebee kit into RGT. 
Sounds oh, cool. yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> uh, actually they've. Uh, I mean, I like to tease my close personal enemies, the Glotman Simpson Cycling Club, but actually they've done a series of uh, tasteful and amusing kits over the years. None of them actually Bumblebee themed. I'm just riffing on the colors, but they've had some very nice uh, stuff, including a sprinkles themed cyclocross kit one year. So full points to them for wow. some, uh, show, bringing some uh, class to the uh, local uh, kit. You know, it looks like we've got a leader in the Cat 2 men's field. Giesler is opening a gap, something I did not expect any rider to be able to do this early and this solo in the Cat 2 field. He's uh, being chased down by Jerome Riken, another strong rider. It looks like Carl Belanger and Westlake are also making up that chase group. And they're joined by a whole bunch of other guys, including the canny Brad Issel, who... When I see Brad sitting in the chase group, I think maybe this attack is under control. Yeah, they don't look super worried got. back there. No. What do we got? It looks like it's a pack of about 10 of them. Uh, maybe seven riders total in that chase group being led by Westlake, who is gapping them very slightly as they climb one of the lesser slopes of this uh, course. They're now at the six kilometer distance, so they've passed through their first lap of this roughly 4K trout course, and they've got another 18 to go, so plenty of time. No need to panic. They're going to ride out the descent, regroup, but meanwhile, Giesler continues to just solo away. Oh, man. Let's see if he can hold this for another 18 kilometers. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck to you if you can. I think we're going to see a lot of fun suffering to entertain us for the next little while. All provided by Mr. Giesler. And Giesler's putting money in the bank early, and uh, I'm going to guess he's going to be counting on the deposits a little bit a uh, little bit later today. He'll be making some withdrawals in about 15 kilometers from now from the time bank that he's building right now. I fear he may not like the interest rates he's going to have yeah. to pay on the <laughs> yeah. back end of this particular transaction. There's a, this is a big old hedge fund right behind him, and they're eyeing his bank account right now. And that's These right. guys his legs are uh, going to be. Yeah. His legs are going to be badly damaged, and the loan shark may be named Brad <laughs> Issel. The way that that group is riding behind him is dangerous too. I mean, it's uh, it, it, it's scary if you're trying to solo away from this group because those guys were definitely riding well together on the flat section you're not going to see it here on the way up obviously because there's not much you can do on the Paderberg but uh, if Geisler was able to see how well that group was riding together he might uh, might be rethinking his solo efforts out there he may also just be hoping to draw someone up with him you know hoping that there's some separation back there someone will see him up the road and someone like Reich in here will be like all right I'll join you I'll try and gap across but uh it's it's uh right. he's right in the middle of that gap yeah we're seeing a true gap because all the field all the groups are now on the uh circuit jerome Riken is about 35 meters behind geisler he's got a uh, guest i think leading the chase there not too far behind it's going to be very interesting to see whether this uh climb will uh reselect our field because right now we've got riders back to about Sean Griffard in eighth place, still sort of in this 20 meter range of Giesler. But oh, who has Riken been joined by? But it's uh, Westlake. In fact, he's not so much joined Jerome as he has just ridden right past him and headed for Giesler. Yep. Giesler no longer looks like a solo breakaway. He's going to have to settle for two up, and that's the best case scenario. The way, given the way that uh, Westlake passed Riken there. Riken continues to keep the two of them in view. And as the Cat 2s crest the hill, it looks like we can take a quick peek and see what the Cat 3 men are doing. They're now on the hill as well. And they are Grupo Compacto, as my old friend, the late Jeremy Story, would miss say when talking about a group coming back together again. And that's <laughs> Vandergreen on the front, but he's now been joined by Richards Cox Green and Michael, probably Matthews. I'll once again, check. I'm afraid that the Michael Matthews and Mark Matthews can under never sort itself out in my head, but I believe this is indeed Michael Matthews. But at the front right now, it's Cox and Vandergreen setting pace 
up the hill, 18%. Even in the virtual world, that's got to be hurting them. You're seeing numbers like 4 watts per kilo, 4.5 watts per kilo, 5 watts per kilo. The rider's giving it. Come back to the Cat 2s here. Looks like we've got Giesler doing his descent. He's got a gap still, so uh, Riken was not able to close up with him after the top of the hill. And in fact, uh, Westlake is closer to Riken than Riken is to Giesler. They're all on the flat, so that is again a true gap. Meanwhile, we've got uh, Guest breaking off of the field. He's also chasing down. But we've got this kind of three riders all sort of shattered off the front, and then a small group led by McCall and Belanger. They are chasing down. <laughs> Sean Griffard almost making it there. Come on, Sean. Your mom says you're still great. I want to see you prove it. These bubble riders sometimes are the most exciting rides to watch on RGT. Graffard, a great example here, just trying to catch on to that front group of seven. He's sitting at number eight on course. And then here's nine, Klaassen, back at to just under four watts per kilo. He's got a little bigger gap at 130 meters. And here we see back Lee Luke there. Hubner. He's uh, still suffering, only 17, maybe he has a lot to learn, but he's also, I think, a tracky at heart, so perhaps his real weakness here was putting in an honest weight today. <laughs> now we're watching Yoshizawa trying to catch up to Hubner. Hopefully Yoshizawa and Hubner can work together because they've got a bit of a gap to close. Hubner is, if I'm reading this right, a little bit away from uh, Klassen. Uh, he's got about 200 meters if those two are going to close up on ninth place and start getting active in this race. But Yeah, look at Hubner uh, trying to redouble his effort, get back on there, <laughs> hang on to that wheel. It's actually really nice to see exactly that. You can see in the effort and in the power that he's racing in the virtual realm exactly as he would race in the real realm, which is he wants to get on that wheel, he wants to join the draft, and he wants to work together with the other rider. So let's see if he can make that work and save himself some energy as they come down this descent. It's looking really great. And I don't know if these two are closing yet on the rider ahead of them class. And it looks like it's still about a 250 meter gap, which is, I think, about what it was before. Yeah. Yeah, not gaining time, not losing time. Sort of just uh, That's right. holding steady back there. And we then were looking this at is, uh, for a moment. Oh. Yeah. We were watching oh, Weaslake yeah, they... up at the front as well. Remember, Weaslake was uh, the first guy that started attacking here from the gun. He was off the front. But it uh, looks like he's paying for that effort now because he's struggling to get up into this front group now with a guest, the last rider tacked on here in the rally kit. Uh, very nice. Yeah, so we've got a group of four here. And then we've got Jerome Riken just ahead of them. And... Then we'll have Giesler still, Giesler still maintaining about a hundred meter lead, which is just a really uncomfortable gap. That is not enough to feel like you've really got a breakaway going, but it is enough that you're in no hope of having anybody come up to help you. So he's going to be out solo for a while, is what I predict. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. got 14 kilometers to go. We're not quite at the halfway mark of this Cat 2 race. Watch Giesler do some beautiful descending. Clearly he has some real virtual talent for this part going downhill. Yeah, great, great virtual descender. <laughs> Excellent we'll steering. There, there... Go ahead. No, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing at my own jokes. It's very sad, but really. We have not quite gotten virtual steering into RGT yet. I know some apps are experimenting with it to make uh, the turning and trying to work through the group a little more realistic. But it is a little weird to be watching the character on the way down the hill and you see these turns, but you don't have to do anything. The character obviously automatically takes the turn for you. All you have to worry about is the power that, uh, that you're putting in. Now, these bends in the road, that you don't have to slow down on these. It's only the like hard turns that they have where it uh, it pays to modulate the power on the way in or the way out. So they're just kind of working their way through. But right here on the right-hand side of the screen where this uh, Cat 3 rider is going through, that's one where you want to let off the power on the way in and then pick it back up on the way out. 
Yes, absolutely. And that is Richards leading our Category 3 field. He is being chased by Michael Matthews, Van de Green, a whole group of them that looks like they're pretty close. Actually, Matthews is closing on him. Then there's a gap back to Van de Green and Cox, who are riding together along with uh, Bayfield. And then it goes to Chan. Matthews has caught Richards. It's beautiful. We'll see if those two can work together. But you can see the group of three trying to chase them down as well on this descent. So the Cat 3 man... Go ahead. Actually, really good riding there by uh, Matthews catching back on. He did. There was no time where he sort of overcompensated on the power. The way that Matthews got up onto Richard's wheel and then just stayed right there was really impressive. Really good modulation from uh, from Matthews there on the way up because it's really hard to catch a rider and then adjust your power to match them instantly and not either go past them or sort of have this slow catch on. So Matthews did a good job there as he caught Richards. You'll probably see it. Here. Here. See how Cox and Vandergreen, they go right by these guys. Not that they want to. It's not like they're trying to pass these guys, but they didn't let off the power quick enough when they made the catch, and that causes these sort of uh, passing scenarios when groups come together. Right, so they're effectively overshooting their target. Right, uh, right. It's, uh, just like in real racing when you make the catch and then realize you need to grab the brakes. But uh, Yeah, I, no I, I, that's probably the best cycle. way to put it. Imagine you bridge across a gap, but then you don't have any way to slow down once you get there. So you just have to rely on coasting to slow you down. Meanwhile, it looks like in our Category 2 field, we've still got Mr. Giesler well off the front. Well, not well off the front, about 60 meters. Ah, we're passing my poor buddy, Y-Ban. Still stuck at the start line. Well, uh, maybe next time, Y-Ban. Get, get the internet figured out. Still trying to get the connection going. <laughs> But we've got Brad Issel and Jerome Riken making the uh, chase group, and they have an uncomfortable 50-meter gap between them and the chasing field, which is McCall, then a little bit back guest. But we've got this sort of strung-out selection here at the front of the Category 2 man. That is going to be probably for the race right now because we're at about yeah. 12 done, 12 Kaya to go. This is the halfway mark, and on a course this selective, I think it's going to be that everybody's got to start thinking about making contact with Giesler again, because if you do not, he will literally ride away from this. He's looking pretty comfortable. He's in like the 3 watts per kilogram range a lot of the time. Now we're cutting back to the Category 3 men, because it looks like Matthews, although he has a small gap, is about to get caught by a chasing field. So we've got Richards, but, Cox, and a whole gaggle behind him. Look at the difference in how this Cat 3 race is playing out. Uh, these guys much more compact once they get to the top of that climb. The other race has really been separating a lot on the Paderberg, but we're seeing larger, closer groups in uh, the Cat 3s. These guys are staying together a little bit tighter on uh, the way up, so it'll make for some different racing. I think the guys over in the Cat 2s are going to find that they're spending a lot of their race chasing back into the group, whereas this group kind of gets together a little quicker. We saw uh, some bigger gaps at the top of the Paderberg and the Cat 2 men. Yeah, maybe a bit more conservative racing with the 3s. Giesler, meanwhile, is putting on a, uh, a uh, tutorial on how to break away and stay away. He's now run up his lead to about 200 meters despite a very strong chasing group. We can see a little, uh, I don't think that's an attack. I think that may be a lapped rider, I'm afraid. So yeah. we've got Riken, McCall, and Issel here as our lead field. That selection of three is the chase right now. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that they are strong enough that everybody else is probably racing for fourth place already. Let me ask you on the other side of that, are they strong enough to catch Giesler if they can work together? Um, I mean... Group of three, if they work together, these guys are not bricks. I know Riken and Issel both. And they're, they're names that I'm well familiar with. I don't know McCall, but he deserves consideration by simply being this far into the race with these two other riders. Giesler has been sitting on a first 100 meter, now a 250 meter, now a rising 280 meter gap. Um... Probably they're strong enough, but boy, Giesler has been dieseling away from this field pretty much 
for the last uh, lap or two. So they've this group of three has to be aware of the problem that they've got, which is they have not caught Giesler at this point. Um, and I am sure they will be digging about as hard as they can. So the answer to your question of whether or not they can catch Giesler is we will find out in about a lap or two. I also preference the question with, if they can work together, can they catch Geisler? And I will say, they are not working together right now. So that part of the question, I guess, is that doesn't matter. Right? They're, they're kind of starting to come together here. I think they're starting to figure it out. Before, they had gaps all over the place. They were passing each other as they would try to rotate through. It just wasn't a smooth group on uh, the platform. They figured it out here because it's nice and flat and steady. They're at like a steady 5% grade, so it's a little easier for them to stay together here. But the art of racing on this Paderberg climb, a lot of it comes in being able to stay together on the undulations, the ups and downs of the course, and uh, the corners, the turns, like we talked about. So I think they're starting to figure it out now but uh, i did want to note that uh, it took a while before that cat that group of three that you're seeing on the left hand side of your screen right now was able to figure out how to ride together so uh, i think that gave geesler a little bit more time to uh, add to his bank yeah it's possible they're just not that experienced with virtual racing so now that they're getting their act together we may see a different tune here meanwhile over on the category three side we see michael matthews once again managing to put it teeny tiny but very insecure gap on a couple other riders he's got richards cox and vandegreen and maybe green as the four chasing him we will see if mr matthews can keep that gap he is on a little baby climb right now a mere six percent barely even notice it in the real world surely <laughs> At least compared to some of the 20% grades that they'll be facing later on in the uh, in the lap. But we're just watching and waiting, seeing if Matthews can hold off this group of four on the climb. Slope is peaking out around 9% for all these riders, so I'm sure they're a little bit in their pain cave. And you can see the wattage numbers spiking, 5 watts per kilo, high fours. This is a hard climb and I think you can see that chase group recognizing that this may be a de decisive move if they let Matthews get away here. And Gap at 130 Matthews. meters for him. Let's see who some of these riders are. Yeah, Matthews is looking pretty good. I mean, again, it's the descent. Let's see if the uh, virtual drafting lets this group of four uh, start closing a bit on Matthews. But he is not letting up. He is pedaling pretty hard considering he's on a descent. You can see that in his watt numbers. Matthews uh, did indicate on his registration that he is new to uh, RGT, to racing on the RGT platform. So... I guess uh, one good way to not have to deal with the physics of other riders is to just get rid of them. Just ride away from them. Simple as that. It's a bold strategy, Brad. Let's see <laughs> if it works. <laughs> right, we're cutting back now to our Category 2 field, and Giesler continues to steam away. His gap has shrunk, but I think that's largely an effect of him just finishing up the hill as his competitors got to the top, bottom of it yeah. so as Giesler tops out here we'll have a bit better sense of whether he's gaining or losing time Riken, Issel and McCall continue to lead that group of three which I think used to be a group of four and they are going hard and now that uh, Giesler has topped out the hill, you can see that gap expanding back up into the 150 meter plus range. So once we watch Riken McCall and Brad Issel top out the uh, this beautiful climb, we will know for sure what that gap is looking like. Though I can see already Giesler is out to 260, 270 meters. So unless they make up some time on the descent here, uh, that gap is growing, and that is bad news for our chasers. That is the sound of Mr. Giesler 
riding away with this category two race. Looking pretty comfortable, although you never know until it's over. Let me reference uh, sitting in ninth place right now. Remember we saw uh, Westlake out uh, in front early on at the start of this race. He had a pretty good, like, 30-second gap that disappeared pretty quickly, and uh, now he is barely inside the top 10. So not how you start. It's how you finish, although I think Giesler has a little better timing here on his move at the front of the Cat 2 men. Yes, absolutely. And we, we saw a little lesson in that with the uh, women's race earlier on when we saw um, more watts from our third place rider uh, not translating into a second place position because basically making the move at the wrong time or not holding with the leaders, not letting somebody else do your work for you. I was looking up his bio and Vince Giesler, our leader in the Cat 2s, is from Victoria on the lovely island of Vancouver. He lists his weakness as a fear of riding in groups, so perhaps that's motivating his early breakaway. <laughs> Maybe even virtual groups are a bit fearful for Mr. Giesler. But whatever it is, he's, he's putting out the big watts today. He's, for a guy who claims to not like climbs, he's definitely doing okay on some pretty harsh grades on this Paderberg course. We, we promised you a selective race, and selective it has been, and it is selected for Giesler. Look at that gap now. It's out over 400 meters to his group of three chasers. That's starting to go from impressive to insurmountable. We're now down yeah. below seven kilometers to go. These guys have time if they, if they work well and are super motivated, but uh, I'm not going to bet on it. And we're just watching our three chasers here. McCall, Brad Issel, Jerome Riken. They are hunting down Giesler, but it may be to no effect. But in the meantime, they are at least doing a pretty good job of eliminating their competition. Yeah, so this is we the second chase group that's formed. These guys uh, trying to catch that uh, front group of Issel, McCall, Belanger, and then Graffard, Claussen, Guest this group of three, and then Hubner a little farther back. So let's call this chase two for fifth, sixth, That's and seventh place. That's right. We've got Cole Belanger, Sean Griffard, and some guy named Klassen. I'll, I'll look him up too. Thought I'd know more of these uh, riders in these Cat 2 and Cat 3 fields, but it's actually kind of appealing that we're seeing a lot of uh, fresh faces. So folks getting into virtual cycling, and I'm hoping that that'll translate into some... Uh, non-virtual bike racing for them in the near future. Yeah, uh, some of the more successful new riders, I will say, that I've seen on this platform uh, have come from other sports. Uh, a lot of really good runners, triathletes. We talked about rowers a little bit ago ending up on these virtual platforms and doing very well because they have those big engines. And, uh, yeah, some of the numbers that these riders put out, uh, I would love to see them race in real life on these courses. Obviously, you have to uh, to add in the bike handling element of it so it, uh, it doesn't translate perfectly. But there are some insane insane power numbers that uh, have have shown up on uh, on a lot of these platforms and we know that they're good because these riders go through verification for a lot of the higher level races they have to verify their weight and calibrate their power meter all that stuff so it's not uh, it's not like you're jumping in the local zwift race where you can just punch in whatever weight you want and you end up getting your butt kicked by some guy that says he weighs 250 pounds but you know that's up for debate <laughs> I was I was absolutely fascinated in reading over the weight verification process. Um, it oh, involves man. taking a video of yourself using a weight of roughly 10 kilograms. Apparently involves something known as a daily newspaper. Maybe you can explain to some of the younger viewers <laughs> what that is, Brad. Yeah, it was uh, hey, back hey, in the day. We would, <laughs> yeah. It's like a printed iPad, basically, that got delivered to your house every day. But, but to explain the joke, the reason for the daily newspaper or the broadcast is to correct, is to uh, accurately date the uh, is to accurately date the video. You'll recognize this from the classic kidnapping movie trope of showing the day's newspaper as a proof of right. life. Right, exactly. 
Yeah, the riders have to uh, video themselves in one take, and it's like you can't ever go off the screen. You have to always show the scale. Uh, yeah, and they put them on the scale with an object of known weight so that it can calibrate it, make sure you're not trying to cheat the system with the scale, which, uh, believe it or not, has been attempted. Anytime there's a, a chance to find an advantage, I guess humans will try and find it. It's in our nature, and uh, it's also in the nature of race organizers to try and weed out that cheating. So you can feel pretty good about these numbers. Uh, I think especially in the pro ranks, almost all of these riders will have gone through a verification program at one point or another. They also have to submit two different power files at the end of the race to make sure that, that uh, the power files line up. They have to do what's called dual recording, which means you have to record your power file independently on two separate devices, and those have to match up. That's how they make sure that you're not hacking your power meter, adding power some you know somewhere down the line in that way. So... I don't know how that works, but I know it's possible. Well, I was uh, talking to my uh, good friend, Dr. Robert Chung, who, for perfectly legitimate reasons, turns out to be accidentally one of the world's experts on how to detect uh, problems with power files, shall we call it. And mm -hmm. the shortest version of what he said is, uh, you know, you're not done making your, um, your fake power file detection proof when you can't tell what the problems are. You're done when somebody else can't tell what the problems are. So suffice right. it to say there's a lot of people who are not quite as smart as they thought they were when they got detected <laughs> cheating power files. So kids out there, honestly, it's easier just to do another workout than it is to try and dope your numbers. Yeah, don't try. It's not worth it. <laughs> but, I mean, maybe do try because, honestly, it gives us something really good to heckle. Um, you know, if any of you ever gets caught... Uh, you know, uh, file doping. I will absolutely make fun of you till yeah. the end of your career as yep. a personal yep. Ryan Cousineau guarantee. <laughs> Meanwhile, back to actual virtual bike racing. We've got uh, Mr. Giesler still way out in front. Well, not that way out. He's dropped down to 100 meters. But again, I think that's an artifact of him just exiting the uh, climb. So we'll yeah. see what his real lead is. And this is the real race. This three. is the real battle of the day. Yeah. And with four kilometers to go, because they're approaching the beginning of the bell lap here, these three may be thinking less about how are we going to catch Giesler and more about how are we going to drop the other two guys in this field. Because mm -hmm. this is the podium selection right now. Second and third place will surely come out of this group. We've got Klaas and Belanger and my good friend Luke Hubner, but they are well back. They will have to settle for minor placings today. And we're taking a peek also at the Category 3 men. And we have Matthews with not much gap anymore because it looks like Green has almost has caught him. And I think Richards is almost there. And now we've got Cox looking ready to join them. And who knows, Vander Green may be within striking distance. I wouldn't swear to it. Although those five are the last five that are within striking distance of each other. This is turning into a good one at uh, the front of the cat. Three men here. Matthews coming back. Green making contact. Richards just off the wheel. There's going to be lots of exciting action. I think what's going to happen is it'll be the classic Paderberg finish. I'll bet you we see this selection of four manage to hang together. And basically, it's going to be a watts per kilo fight on yep. the final climb to the finish. So this race has become very hard and yet very simple. That is a uh, probably pretty good guess on how this one ends up today. Both groups out on their last lap of racing inside four kilometers to go. So uh, again, the finish line comes just after they get to the top of the Paderberg there. They make that right-hander and then it's about to 120 meters from the top of the climb to that uh, that paved section around the corner where they actually hit the finish line. I hope the guys in that group have realized that uh, the finish line is, uh, is a little bit past the mm -hmm. top of the climb because I would hate to see the uh, that group of Cat 3 men sprint to the top of the climb and then give up the ghost. Would you really hate to see it, though, Brad? Would you really? No, no I would love to see it. I'll be honest. I, I, yeah, I'd love to see it. Yeah. <laughs> I would hate it for them. <laughs> yeah, we'd feel sad. I love for a them. good early we'd... celebration. Yeah, yeah. I'd be sure to tell whichever uh, rider committed that uh, terrible sin that I felt very bad for him 
each and every time I saw that rider in, for the next five years. Right. Back on the uh, race course, it looks like we've got Giesler now only 2.3 kilometers from the finish line, and his gap has not shrunk. It is, in fact, now 400 meters. He has just been a machine on this course, and barring some sort of disaster or a virtual mechanical, I think that he has bagged his first victory here today. But there is so much to race for because we've got Riken, Issel, and McCall still making up that excellent chasing group. They may be 300 meters back of Giesler, but they are going to be racing each other. Hammer and tongs for second, third, and fourth. Yeah, this will be the one to watch today in uh, this pair of races as the Cat 2 men work out the last two podium spots available with Giesler up the road looking like he's going to take the top step. And one of these guys going to get trimmed off the podium today. Assuming we do a three-deep podium, I guess we could go with the, the wide-angle five-deep podium, but uh, I think we'll stick with the classic three-up podium for today. For sure, for sure. You know, we're not a mountain bike race after all. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> they have their five-deep podiums. It's just adding two riders on top, uh, on the outside of the, the regular podium. I don't know, it's just... It just, I'm not, a, I'm a traditionalist. I'm not into that. Yeah. Giesler continues his chase at the front. He's still got 200 meters on Issel, Riken, and McCall. And he shows no signs of surrendering any piece of that lead. If anything, he may be expanding his lead. It may be as simple as the racing starting to get tactical behind him. And therefore, yep. there is not much worry Vince Giesler once uh, again he's from Victoria he says he's an autism ambassador well he's ambassadoring very well today he is showing off his big watts and he's showing off his already mentioned fear of riding in groups <laughs> this is certainly one way to deal with it just uh, you know crank out an average 4 watts per kilogram for the better part of 41 minutes and uh, you yes. too can ride alone Yes, he's shown a tremendous amount of motivation. So who says that fear is a bad thing? Meanwhile, we're right. looking back at our still competitive chase group, Issel, Riken, McCall. McCall is taking a quick little lead here as he comes down the descent. They are only five, one kilometer from the finish, but that one kilometer does in fact include a very big hill. And Giesler on the final climb of the day here. He's still putting out numbers, which is kind of impressive because he must know by now yeah. that he has this locked up. Uh, and either he's here for the workout or he's here for the bragging rights to be putting out five watts per kilogram on this final climb. But away he goes, and let's admire him for it. He's steaming away. He's only 340 meters for victory. Come on, you virtual fans. Go ahead and cheer on Vince as he uh, crests this hill and very quickly take this impressive victory against an impressive field. Like I say, I know who Brad Essel and Jerome Riken are, and they are no slouches. They are real threats in the Cat 1-2 fields locally. And for Giesler to have gapped them so decisively in this race is just a super impressive performance. So we will expect great things of this man in future non-virtual racing. He's 51 years old. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. I guess he's been training. Sounds like he's ridden with enough groups in his life that he's he's done with them, you know? It's like at one point you're like, I'll just head out on my own. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think he's not quite crested the hill, but he's coming very close. 150 meters to go in this entire race. Hup, hup, hup indeed, Vince Giesler. Take your well-earned victory. He's only got 120 meters on the uh, chase group, but again, that's a gap that I think is informed more by the fact that they're still on the climb, or that he was on the yeah. climb and they were catching him there. Giesler wins. Nicely done. And now we're going to see the uh, chase for second, third, and fourth. Oh. Oh, Riken, Riken has dropped him. That's how like it's done. Like a sack of potatoes. Oi, 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 Riken. In the last, let's say, 50 meters of that climb, put the hammer down. That's it. He's gone. 
And McCall and Issel are going to have to duke it out behind him. So Riken will be good for second. And Riken Looks rolls like McCall at home. We've still got a little gap yep, here. Yeah, McCall's done it. So McCall looks like an easy third place, and Brad Issel will have done all that suffering for a mere fourth, which, as we've already explained, is not a real podium position. And <laughs> Wesselake will take fifth place, it looks like. He's got a little gap between him and my old friend Luke Hubner. So Hubner will have nice to go sixth. Yeah, go ahead by Wesselake. Yeah, nice job today, because remember, he had a really strong early start. He dropped down to like 8th, ninth place for a while, and then obviously fought his way back through past that group. So uh, Westlake finds his way up into the top five. Meanwhile, Matthews over in our Cat 3 race, about to wrap his day up. And look at this, Green, not far off. But Matthews has just been nursing this like 20-meter lead every time we check in over here with the Cat 3s. I don't think it's going to be enough for uh, Green to be able to catch him here, so... Looking like Matthew's going to be our next solo winner here in the Cat 3 men. Yeah, nicely done. Once again, the Patterberg really decides this race. Oh, Green, Green takes almost got well it. second. Oh. Wow. So close. And it looks like we're going to see Richards solo through for third. He will surely be followed by Cox. And the race starts getting not very close. I see Michael Goodman there in sixth place, almost a kilometer behind. But no shame in that. This has been a strong field. I know that Goodman is a strong rider. So, again, these are just big, strong fields. Oh, and the Cat 2 field. Sean Griffard is coming home for the finish. Mrs. Griffard, you should be very proud of your boy. He did pretty good to get 11th place today against a very stacked field, in my opinion. So... Chapeau. And now we're watching Cox and the Cat 3 men come across the line for fourth. He is. Throw up your hands. In real life, if you can't do it virtually, Mr. Cox, you have done a good job today, even if you only got a mountain bike boating position. Top five is top five as we take a look at our Cat 2 men's results with Vince Giesler taking the win today in 43-43 for 4.31 watts per kilo. Wow, big day out there for Vince. Jerome Riken ends up second at 3.83 watts per kilo, and then Taylor McCall in third at 4.09. This is where you can really see the importance of drafting here. Uh, Riken did a really nice job drafting in that group of three. Brad Issel was the best drafter out of uh, Riken, McCall, and Issel. He ended up with 3.76 watts per kilo. Not sure how much of that was uh, lost at the end when he got gapped off into fourth. And then Soren Wieslake up into fifth. Again, great ride to uh, recover on the day at uh, 57 seconds back. But you can really see with uh, Soren's huge watts per kilo numbers, uh, two things, right? First, that uh, big breakaway put in start. And second, the difference between making the big move and making the right move. Meanwhile, we've got Luke yeah. Hubner also putting in a very credible wattage number. You saw him come across the line for sixth place. So that was a fantastic pair of races there, those Category 2s and Category 3s. We're going to look at the Cat 3 results now. Uh, yes, Michael G Matthews, riding for the Gastown Cycling Club, gets it done, holding off a hard-charging Paul Green there at the finish. And in third place, we have Lon Richards. Good finishes all around. Yeah, Cox is going to end up fourth place. Uh, Vanda Green in fifth. And uh, there might be a few riders still on their way in here. As uh, we wrap those riders up. Yeah, out on course. Uh, just finishing today on uh, this very tough. Again, this is a really hard course to start your entry into RGT. So uh, if you're a new rider to the RGT platform, it gets easier. Don't worry. There, uh, there are some easier courses to come here in the virtual BC Cup as uh, we get ready for the next three weeks of racing here. All right, so getting ready for our pro women up next, a scheduled 1030 local start time. We are about 12 minutes away from that. So let's take another quick break here. And when we come back, we'll pick up our pro women's race up next in the virtual BC Cup.
Stop one of the first ever BC Cup virtual race presented by Cobotics here as the riders get ready to conquer the Paderberg climb on the RGT platform. Brad Stoner here with Ryan Cousineau as uh, we get down to our final two races of the day with pro women followed by pro men coming up next. Pro women just about uh, just under seven minutes away from getting started. So, Ryan, this is where we start to get into uh, some more familiar names. We start to see some high level names in these races uh, as we move into our elite races of the day. I'm going to say the big name that sticks out to me for the pro women's race is Jackie Gobby. We're going to be talking a lot about her today. She has been dominant in the Echelon Racing League, which I had the uh, opportunity to announce over the last few months. But there's going to be a lot of riders in here that are new to Godby, so she won't know a lot of riders in this group. And I think that's going to be a big advantage, having this new mix of riders out there. It's going to make for some really interesting racing. Yeah, I'm uh, very excited to see what happens here. Uh, Godby will be racing against the uh, class of the local uh, women's peloton. We're going to see some names like uh, Esta Beauville, who is absolutely ageless and is a solid threat in any local field. We've got uh, Fiona Magendi, a relatively young rider for the uh, 
red truck team. I think she'll be racing for Pickle Juice Pro Cycling in this event. And uh, Pam Troyer, another uh, another classically strong rider. She, uh, on the road, races for the Mighty Mighty Cycling Cycling Club. And she's badged as Velocity Vixens for tonight's event. And there's Claire Cameron. She is a force to be reckoned with in local bike racing. So my pick for the matchup of the day will be Jacqueline Godby versus Claire Cameron. That will really be the 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 thing to watch in terms of who's going to bring it to from the local riders to the uh, out of town hero. Well, no pressure for Claire Cameron, but uh, her competitor Jackie Godby has a pretty strong resume in virtual racing. An American rider, she was on the World Championship eSports racing team where she ended up fifth place in the world there. She, uh, as I said, just won the Echelon Racing League and in real life is a Chicago triathlon winner. So it uh, gives you an idea of the level of fitness that Jackie Godby brings to this one. What is, uh, what's the background for Claire? Uh, a thoroughbred bike racer or uh, would she be a hybrid athlete maybe coming from a different sport? She's a bike racer through and through. Um, she participates in pretty much all of the local disciplines. She's an avowed roadie, but she also has lots of track experience. And I know in the last few years, she's done uh, a lot of gravel riding for fun and pleasure. Um, she's uh, she's a huge threat. She's just you know an all-rounder, I would say. But uh, she wins races not so much, I think, through sprinting, but by just overpowering her competitors. Well, then I, the virtual racing will be a good fit for her because uh, there's certainly room to bring out the 10-pound hammer on RGT as uh, if uh, if you can turn those watts out, you, you can rely a little less on uh, on bike handling and race tactics in the virtual world of virtual racing here. So it'll be interesting to watch. Uh, the other thing I'm wondering about Claire is how well she knows the RGT platform now because I know Godby has a lot of experience on the platform. She's very well versed in how this game works and how it's best played. So um, I'm wondering how much time Cameron has spent on the RGT platform. Yeah, I can't speak to that. I haven't asked her about it. I should uh, I should bug her. I'd uh, DM her right now, but I think that Claire will probably be busy with other matters with three minutes to go before our race. Um, I would suspect, though, that the, uh, that the experience gap will be in favor of Jacqueline. Um, you know, there's not a lot you can say about that. She's, you know, you know better than I do, but Jacqueline's uh, Palmares are pretty serious. Uh, there's lots of strong local riders, but nonetheless, uh, they are all going to have their work cut out for them in racing against Ms. Godby. Now, how will a triathlete like Jackie Godby respond on the Paderberg? It's a little different than the type of riding, let's say, that uh, a triathlete would be used to. This is explosive riding, Ryan. On uh, this climb, we've seen, I think, just about every race, the uh, that final climb has been decisive. Even if you can get a group of like three, four, five, six riders together to the bottom of the climb on the last lap, we haven't seen a single race that, the, that a, a group has been together when they hit the top of the Paderberg climb. No, absolutely not. It's as selective in virtual racing as it is in real racing, and I'm sure that'll be the pattern this time. In fact, I think what we will see is with this four-kilometer circuit that ends with the Paderberg climb, you'll probably see the usual jockeying for position right from the gun, but the real decisive moment at the near the start of the race will be what groups do we see selected out after they've been up the Paderberg once. Right. Yeah, That'll it'll it'll shake out race. after that first lap. Exactly. Yeah. If uh, if we, you miss that gap and you end up with a big gap, you're going to have a real hard time covering that uh, on this course. Yeah, it'll be both uh, educational for us and decisive for how the race uh, goes from there. So, yeah. Don't don't uh don't think that you can come in 10 minutes late and get an idea of this race about kilometer 4 from the gun is where we're going to see the first important action of this race. And again, I'm going to make my public service announcement for riders new to the platform. you got to have that power up at the start. When uh, it starts counting down, you should already be up into your higher power zone so that when it hits zero, you're at max power and you can rock it off the line. Very important. To, I've seen a lot of races ruined by either uh, just not knowing or not paying attention thinking you're just going to slowly ease into the race like you can. A lot of riders can start at the back of a criterium road race. It's an hour, two hour long race, plenty of time to get to the front. No reason 
reason to be panicked at the start. You need to be a little panicked at the start of our GT racing. It's uh, it's just more important uh, on the virtual platforms than in real life. So looks like we are just about ready to get rolling here, about 40 seconds away from our Category 1 women taken to the course. Now, we've been running dual races previously. These riders will be uh, all together. We're just looking at a couple different camera views of our start line today. Just one race out on course right now as these riders get ready to do six laps around the 4.2-kilometer Paderberg course here on our GT. Right, so we're about 17 seconds from the start. There's a few other riders we haven't talked about quite yet. We've got Angie Bonasisi. Uh, she races in real life for the WOW Ride program. And we'll just let the start speak for itself as we get down to three, two, one, and away they go. I think just Trailer about everyone hit the power numbers at the start. I think pretty much everyone was there where they needed to be. So it's going to keep everyone together. Nice to see that uh, everyone got a good start. And Jackie got to be right where she wants to be, up at the front here. She's being chased by Nadia Gontova, another local rider who races for the UBC rowing team. So, uh, yet another crossover athlete. I see Pam Troyer. Uh, she claims to be an architect, possibly for the Vandalay and Associates firm. Not sure about that. Pam's going to kill me for that joke, I'm sure of it. <laughs> Claire Cameron, Angie Bonasisi trying to hold that gap. And then I think we've got Holly Larson still on the field there. But God, as God. in accordance with the prophecy, Godby is off the front. <laughs> We're very hopeful that our local girls can manage to close that gap, which is already forming. And I feel like this is, in fact, a group that understands the threat and will, in fact, work together. Yeah. So... For Godby, this may become a kind of one versus 100 situation. She's going to have to fight off the class of the local Cat 1-2 uh, women's field uh, in order to win this race. But maybe she's talented enough. Well, I will say with Jackie Godby, even in the Echelon Racing League, we saw a lot of races play out this way, where it was a solo rider up the front and then a chase of anywhere between four and ten riders. Very rarely was that chase able to catch Jackie Godby. I mean, she is just that good. Uh, in fact, her coach, Chris Navin, who's going to be racing in the pro men's race later today, he told me that her numbers are pretty much on par with the current hour record numbers and that if she really focused and spent time on the track and focused on getting that aerodynamic position dialed in. The numbers that she generates are world hour record numbers, which for virtual racing, when a lot of times the race is right around an hour, is just perfect. So Jackie Gabby is the real deal. And uh, if you're not uh, able to hang with Jackie Gabby today, you don't need to feel bad about it because uh, you're looking at a world-class athlete on the front of this Cat 1 women's field. But speaking of hanging with ja Jacqueline Godby, we've got Pamela Troyer right there. She has detected the threat and decided that she is going to make the effort. So this is some fantastic riding by a local woman. Let's see if Pam can hang on there. She certainly has experience at the top of the um, uh, at the top of this sport because she has raced the UCI rated Tour de Delta before. I'm pretty confident about that. But she's showing no signs of being intimidated by uh, Godby's reputation and is simply hanging on to that wheel. But for Troyer, I fear the real moment of truth, as I say, will come at about the four-kilometer mark. Behind Troyer, now, we can is not one. opposed. Sorry, Godby mm -hmm. not opposed to racing with other riders. I mean, if Godby sees an opportunity for a rider behind her that they can ride together, she'll let up. She'll absolutely let off the gas to let another rider come up and join her. One, because she wants the help, but two, because Jackie Godby is now to the point where she can afford to do things like that just to make the race interesting. I mean, she's, uh, she's really able to sort of dictate the way that this race plays out, and she will let up uh, in order to, if another rider has just a shot of catching on, she'll, she'll give those rider shots uh, early on at least so uh, they'll have a, a couple opportunities we saw Troyer already with one but God be gonna step on the gas again and it looks like Troyer having a little trouble responding this time yeah it uh, yeah having said that Troyer managed to close that gap and hold it uh, she's now returning to the field so now it's going to be Cameron Troyer Bonasisi Larson Magendi and Guntava 
all really Grupo Compacto there. Now, a little bit less compacto. You can see that it's Troyer and Cameron making a gap from the field. But this group has to work hard and work together if they've got any chance of catching Godby at this point. It's already becoming a race that is on the verge of being out of reach. But and even in this scenario, Godby is so good. She's got so much power that like, it's almost, even if the group works together at 100% efficiency, even that might not be enough to catch Jackie Godby. The, the group can work together as well as they can, but uh, if the wattage just isn't there, if the numbers aren't there, obviously it's not going to be enough to get up to Godby. So even if they do figure out the drafting, Godby may still be, uh, be putting time into that group. So again, we're just keeping an eye on the gap. You can see it on the left-hand side of the screen as to the right of the rider's name. It shows you the gaps to all of the riders around them. So you see Jackie Godby holding on to about a 140-meter gap. Back to Claire Cameron right now. Yes, indeed. The cold equations of bike racing show no mercy. You pretty much have to make the wattage, and never more so than in virtual cycling. We've, we've seen from the watts per kilo numbers that there's still a strong element of strategy, managing your work, and, you know, working as a group, but when you see a power output uh, delta like you were seeing here between Godby and the rest of the field, it may be simply insurmountable. We're getting a bit of truth here right now because we've just at the 3.8 kilometer mark uh, seen Godby get to terms with the Paderberg climb and now the rest of the riders are also on that climb so everybody is experiencing the joyful suffering of a slope that starts out at about 10% grade and then ramps its way up to about 20% and has no mercy. Joyful suffering. Yes. I like that. Well, they, they wouldn't be here if they didn't want to be. Nobody... Nobody's doing this for a job except for possibly Godby herself. All of the rest of these folks have perfectly normal J jobs. Uh, Claire may be a school teacher, maybe not. As I said, Pam claims to be an architect, and so on and so forth. Godby is a, a doctor. She's on her way to oh a PhD in radiology. Actually just got her uh, assignment for her residency. She's going to be moving from Chicago to St. Louis, and uh, she'll be a, a doctor in a few years. So gives you an idea of the caliber of riders in our top five here at the front of the pro women's field. Yeah, she's got the... Uh, so she's not going to get outsmarted in this race either. Although, right. uh, maybe, maybe Pam and Claire will be mad at me for making that joke. It's... But, uh, yeah, Godby is already showing her form. 180 meters gap now as she crests the top of the Paderberg climb. We've still got uh, Larson, Troyer, Bonacici et al. Uh, chasing, uh, wow. suffering away. And Yeah, so this is the, the non-Jackie Godby part of the race that we're looking at <laughs> here. You right. can pretty much divide this up into, into two parts of the race. There's the Jackie Godby part of the world and then the non-Jackie Godby part of the world back here. That's right. So we've got category Godby and category not Godby. Right. In the not Godby division, it looks like Bonacici is going to lead them over the top, um, followed by Larson Gontova, but they're all really Grupo Compacto. It's still a uh, completely together field all the way down to Troyer. So there's a group of six that's going to be chasing down Godby, but they need to work because the gap is now 540 meters with the, with the group of not Godby coming over the top. So in this locals versus Godby uh, contest, it's uh, it turns out that the odds of six to one may not be enough. Well, Angie Bonacici knows Jackie Godby well. They race together in the entirety of the Echelon Racing League. Uh, Angie was with us pretty much every week for the ERL. And uh, she was always hanging with that group trying to catch Jack Godby. So this is not new to uh, Angie Bonacici. She's seen Godby do this before. She's watching her do it again. And uh, I hope that she's kind of cautioning these riders like, hey, this is the real deal up the road. It, it, it might not be worth it to catch on here. The, uh, the riders can communicate in here via chat in the game. There's a, a chat box that the, uh, the athletes have access to. So in theory, the riders in this group would be able to communicate and try and get together. Godby can also read that chat. It's a, a universal chat for all the riders in the race. So it's not like you can come up with some secret plan to try to ambush a solo rider off the front. But there is the ability for a little bit of communication, which is going to be most important in the group on the left-hand side of your screen. These riders can get in the chat, maybe talking about uh, what their FTP is, if 
there's a, a watt per kilogram number that they want to try and target. They want to try and average for the next 20 minutes or so. Or if it's just swapping information, trying to figure out, uh, you know, who's in the group, what's going on up the road, how strong is Jackie Gotti, that kind of stuff in the chat. So I'm not sure if they're utilizing the chat today. Again, it's a sort of, an, I guess, an advanced feature, if you will, of, uh, of RGT. But there is an opportunity for these riders to communicate. Yeah, that'd be fantastic, if only for the wonderful smack talk opportunities. Although I suspect yeah. that everybody in this race is breathing pretty hard at the moment. And they may not be thinking of their best one-liners of all time. As for strategy, I'm pretty sure that for our chasing group at this point, the strategy is try riding harder, maybe. But uh, I'm not sure that that's going to be very viable. They're looking, um, well, pretty bunched up at the moment. We will see if that's an organized, disorganized, or maybe just a cautious chase. There's a real prospect that they've looked at this gap, and with the gap already out to a staggering 800 meters, uh, between Godby and the field, they may have decided that this is a race for second place already. Yeah, and Which absolutely we... nothing wrong with that because, uh, again, it, it's, you know, you're talking about Jackie Godby here who is an exception when you talk about riders that you want to chase down. I mean, this is one of the best virtual riders in the world right now going solo off the front. So there's no shame in uh, this race for second place back there. It's almost impossible to catch Jackie Godby. Well, let's put it this way. There's only four riders in the world that were able to do it at the world championship so don't feel bad if you're not one of those four able to beat jackie godby in a virtual race no uh, she's a fantastically classy rider and you can just see by these numbers it's just you know she's doing what needs to be done in order to win this race and she's going to do it in fine form it looks like unless she has some sort of mechanical problem virtual mechanical as we said Meanwhile, back in our chasing field, they are still Grupo Compacto. They're doing the descent, so they're all keeping fairly well together. We were talking about uh, Angie Bonasisi um, a little earlier, so not only is she familiar with Godby and doing a lot of virtual racing, she's also done a lot of real racing, but she's also a real contributor to the sport. Um, she's uh, or She sits on the board of Cycling BC, which is great volunteer effort and she's organized some fantastic events including one that I was lucky enough to participate in in 2019 which was all about uh, getting young women riders into cycling for the first time so it was a, awesome. a meet and greet and a social event which was really telling these riders how do you start into the sport of cycling and and for both men and women I think that's a tremendously intimidating problem which is so you like riding your bike, so you like riding fast, what next? Um, and it can, be, it can be a real challenge for a lot of riders to answer that question. And for any of you who happen to be watching this and are wondering, now how do I get into real bike racing But when real bike racing can start? Well, hitting the virtual trainer and doing some virtual events is an excellent start because that will tell you where your wattage numbers are and whether you're starting to be competitive and what level you need to train to after that what i would tell you is get involved with a local club there's lots of them in vancouver depending on where you live there's probably lots of them where you are just getting out with group rides with experienced riders will again you'll find your level and you'll start to understand the basics of what it means to get into pack riding and racing and they will also give you access especially locally i know we have a lot of uh virtu we have a lot of uh learn to race programs so for a lot of the local races, we require that you have taken some sort of learn to race program before you strap it on. We just do that as a as a safety uh, as a safety improvement to the sport. But I think it's also another step in which riders can get a taste of racing in a safe environment and sort of really understand what it's going to mean to strap on a helmet and line up at the start line for their first real race. What a great program! Great opportunity. And uh, you're right, it is a big hill the first time you uh, you conquer that hill of getting into bike racing. But having a good group with you, good group bes uh, behind you, certainly makes it a little easier. So uh, shout out to Angie and all the race promoters. You know, we talk a lot about missing the racers and the missed opportunities for riders this year in the, in the era of COVID. But uh, we got to give some shout outs to the event promoters, too. They're the real backbone of, uh, of, of our local bike racing scenes, because without those events, 
There's not much racing you, you can do. You need to progress through those lower level events to get up to the higher level and, you know, one day race to pro race at a race like uh, like Gastown or a race uh, in uh, BC Super Week. So Angie and company doing a great job up, uh, up in your neck of the woods. It's good to see that uh, those riders are in promoters, I should say, are are uh, staying in contact here. Yeah, it's uh, fantastic. We're we're blessed with a lot of really good race uh, race organizers in the Lower Mainland. I know my buddies like uh, like uh, Todd Hansen who runs the Thursday Nighters out in Richmond. We've got the United Velo Club uh, with Heather Kay and Jeff Warham really running the show. They do a, a fantastic race series in about uh, 50 kilometers out of town uh, at a uh, at a closed circuit racing course, like a road racing course. So that's a fantastic Wednesday night event. I'm very proud of what uh, my club, Escape Velocity Cycling, uh, does with the uh, what we call the World Tuesday Night Championships, the biggest of the midweek crit series. And we're hoping that we will have some extremely exciting news about what's happening with Tuesday Nighters later this year. And that news will also be coming later this year. So we'll see how that goes. And then there's Mark Ernsting, the uh, longtime organizer of, the, of Super Week itself. He's a fantastic guy who I've had the pleasure of working with. And I know he's uh, very hopeful that he can uh, get that uh, event going again for 2022. Hopefully we've returned to something more like normal. And I'm sure there's a couple of names that I've absolutely missed. Oh, Barry Lister will definitely be mad at me if I don't uh, mention his name. He's the organizer of Jeremy's Roubaix, and I know he's got a few events coming up on the calendar. And these are all events that are organized under the auspices of Cycling BC. Well, of course, also our uh, hosts and sponsors for today's event here, the wonderful world of RGT. You can find a lot of those events on the Cycling BC website. They do a great job of uh, keeping the series updated on there. I was looking at uh, some of the series they offered or wanted to offer in 2020. They're going to be rolling into 2021, but uh, a lot of resources on the Cycling BC website. Highly encourage you to check that out if you're Looking into getting into racing in the area, or uh, maybe just want to ride a little more. Certainly, a, a club is a good way to do that, and then find one of those one of those entry events that you can go uh, go check out. Most of these clubs, uh, Ryan, are more than happy to welcome new members. I think a lot of people are intimidated by uh, you know cold joining a club, but pretty much every single one of these clubs you're going to come across will be more than happy to welcome a new rider into the sport. Yes, absolutely. In fact, a lot of them even have programs that are fairly specifically organized around how do you get into road racing, right? And I mean, like I said, I like to make fun of my close personal enemies, the Glotman Simpsons, but uh, they're they're a great club. They actually are also a, an event organizer. They do the Seymour, the Cypress Challenge every year. I have to remember that one because my club organizes the Seymour Challenge. These are the two premier hill climb events that with any luck, will both actually be happening in August if uh, all goes well and if uh, if the health uh, if the provincial health authority restrictions allow. Um, there's lots of other good clubs in town. I think of Mighty Cycling. We've mentioned the Gastown uh, Club. Uh, you know, uh, you know. There's many others, like I said, that I've missed. My own club, Escape Velocity, is really good. They have a uh, fantastic youth development program. We're really proud of called the Devo and Cannondale program and we'll be seeing a few of those riders in the uh, in the elite races uh, that have come through that program it's just uh, we're, we're kind of lucky we've got a pretty we've got a pretty active and and well organized uh, local racing scene and yeah cycling bc has more details on all of these clubs and who you can get in contact with if you're looking for a club and you want to start riding and they it's a little complicated right now with you know tremendous restrictions on things like group rides so it's not quite the same as trying to join a club in the usual times but get in touch and they'll help get you on track because i know that there's genuine plans for racing in 2021 later in the season and there's a lot of organizers who are just basically we've got our events planned and we're just waiting for the go ahead when we can finally safely race again and in the meantime you can always race on RGT, free to race on the RGT platform. There is a premium tier if uh, you want access to more courses and more features, but uh, if you just want to get on ride, try out the virtual racing maybe. Uh, RGT, free to race to uh, a certain level, and then if uh, you want to jump in the virtual BC Cup, you can find the uh, the entrance to that as well on the 
Cycling BC website. So hopefully we'll see some more people uh, joining the series as we press through our four weeks of racing here in the virtual BC Cup. Again, if you don't like hills, the uh, the next stop might be a little better. Canary Wharf is a uh, well, mostly flat riding, let's say. So uh, the sprinters will have their day on stop number two next weekend. So we return to the uh, racing action in front of us here. We've got Jacqueline Godby continuing her extremely diligent tutorial on how to break away and stay away. She's increased her gap to 1.3 kilometers over the chasing field. They have covered uh, two and a half laps over almost 12 kilometers now. And they've got just over 13 kilometers remaining in this race, so we're very close to the halfway mark. Behind uh, Jacqueline, we've got Grupo Compacto, Cameron, Gontavia, uh, Bonasisi, Magendi, and Troyer, and Larson, all of them together still. So this group of six, I think we can say it's ceased to be a chase in any meaningful way, because I think that yeah. Godby is still opening the gap. And this yet, is going to be a good uh, battle back here, though. This this is enough riders that uh, we'll be able to see some some good dynamics back in this second group as they start to sort it out here in the last three laps of racing now. But uh, I think the real story is going to be still in uh, in the chase group. It's going to be the action at the back. It's going to be more riders coming unglued off the back of the race rather than riders attacking up at the front of uh, what I guess we'll call the peloton in uh, group number one on the left-hand side of your screen. See, already starting to get gapped off here. This is the real story of these groups. It's like the uh, the old Agatha Christie novel, Ten Little Indians, and then there were nine, <laughs> and then there were eight, and then there were seven. They just slowly kind of one by one disappear out of this group. So you're implying that one of these riders might be the murderer, but they'll accidentally they'll sneakily <laughs> drop themselves early. Sorry, spoilers. Well, I guess. yeah, sometimes I, there I may usually have just is a rider in there. Right. <laughs> There's well, an eighth right grader now, the, out there that uh, just had their book report ruined. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out the real killer is, of course, the hills of Paterberg. And right now, right. the rider whose hopes they are murdering is Fiona Magendi. She's gone about 120 meters off the back. You hate to see it, but uh, maybe she can make it back up on the descent. But it is that kind of race of attrition, so don't doubt that these chasing riders are riding hard because Magenda is, yep. Magenda is a class rider, and for her to get gapped here tells you how hard this field is going. And you can see other small gaps forming. Troyer and Larson are now desperately trying to chase onto the group of three ahead of them. A group of four, I the guess. The other thing I'll say about uh, RGT is it's really intense in the physics. Uh, on Zwift, for example, you can get away with just sort of riding, right? You just kind of you ride in your zone, you set your wattage, and, like, you can do other stuff. You can watch TV, you can answer an email, you can pet your dog, whatever. In in RGT, the, the physics are much more punishing if you don't respond to what's going on around you perfectly. So, like right here, where you see Troyer uh, accelerated there just a little bit, if Larson's not paying attention, like paying close attention, and she doesn't respond to that move really quickly, that puts Larson in trouble pretty quickly. So, yeah, the riders pay really close attention, I think much more attention on RGT than maybe any other platform, just because the drafting and physics are uh, are weighted so heavily on RGT here. So there's also a mental game of just having to, you know, stare at your screen for uh, for what's 23 minutes now with really without being able to break concentration. It uh, I don't know what else where else you would have that. I guess like getting tunnel vision when you're just in the middle of a group for a long time just staring at that wheel in front of you. Yes, I think it has a lot of resemblance to actual bike racing there, Brad. It's uh... But we're, we're watching Pam Troyer here. She's deep in her pain cave and surely staring into her screen because she's got this tiny five-meter gap she's trying to close, perhaps uh, paying for her early effort to hang with Godby, yeah. which was uh, pretty heroic for about a half a lap. But let's see if she can close this group. I'm not too worried. Troyer's strong. She's pretty smart. I suspect she's riding within her limits, and she may be looking to just manage this gap up the climb and then rejoin this group on the flats at the top of the hill. Totally. So yeah, probably the best thing to do here, actually, to make sure you don't redline here, don't go any deeper than you have to. Yeah, she's going to close the gap right here. Just when she was within striking distance, she was like, all right, I'll go see if I can get a get a, a draft up here. 
and right back in. So you called it, Ryan. Uh, she was there by choice. <laughs> yeah, she did a little dig there. Maybe she saw, uh-oh. I don't know if we're seeing a connection drop or what, but we just saw a big slowdown in her power and a few other riders. But it uh, looks like we are back to Grupo Compacto, although uh, Fiona Magendi may object to that. She's still hanging 15 meters off this group. As we look at the reverse camera angle, we can see her there in the distance. She's suffering. Hopefully, like uh, Troyer, she can uh, find a way to manage the gap and then close it up on the descent. But... We'll call it Grupo Compacto, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, Troyer and Magendi are entirely in agreement with that description. But they are coming through for the finish line of lap number three, I believe. And I think that will leave them with three to go. Yeah, so we'll call this the halfway mark. That's right. We'll get the crossed flags at the halfway point. Magendi there, just about to cross through the finish line. Again, she'll have her work cut out for her. She's got a gap to close on this flat, followed by a descending section of the course. So get on it, Fiona. You've got some work to do. The race is there to play for. But let's not forget about uh, Jackie Godby. She is still out front there. Soon to be Dr. Jackie, I guess. She yeah. has opened a clinic on how to win a race. <laughs> She can't hear this, right? Like, we're safe, right? She's, she's no, not going to no, try and hunt worry. me down after. Okay, good. good. <laughs> That's super. She's 1.3 kilometers ahead, looking like she's in no difficulty, just casually dialing in 5 watts per kilogram on this uh, smooth part of the course. So uh, Amazing. If this is a training ride for Godby, it's a training ride with uh, some real oomph. But she's got she she's it. got a solid commanding gap here. Yeah, an incredible that, ability to ride solo here. I mean, this is a a skill within itself to be able to to hold that power alone. I mean, there's a certain mental block to just cranking out the wattage when you have nobody around you. It really takes a strong mental rider to be able to do that. God be a shown. She's got it. She just has that killer instinct to be able to put herself into the red zone and stay there. It's amazing. Yeah, she's putting out a big gap, and it's not only not shrinking at all. In fact, it's still growing. Um, I'm doing the math here. If the if the chasing field flags at all, Godby may be a threat to lap them during this race, yeah. which mm -hmm. I think is, is only a problem in terms of bragging rights. But uh, nonetheless, there's a goal for you chasers is try not to get lapped by Godby today. It's a four-kilometer circuit, and she's already got near enough a two-kilometer lead. And you can be sure Jackie Gobby is looking at that going, I wonder if I can lap these guys today. I wonder if I can go a lap up. Let's see. I'll give it a shot. I'm kind of bored. <laughs> maybe, maybe, that'll, uh, maybe that'll put some super motivation to our chasing field. But they've yeah. also got a lot of racing against each other to do, and that may take primacy because second and third are still absolutely in play for this field. Well, look at Troyer over it. here. Yeah, she's in uh, just a bit of trouble here. Troy and Magendi have not caught back onto the field, so they are now getting gapped off the back and in real danger of having that be more or less deciding their race. Uh, so they are looking like they will lock in 6th and 7th if they don't watch out, and I'm sure they're pretty desperately trying to uh, get back to terms with the uh, four riders that they are chasing down. Magendi certainly looks like she's on her way up to Troy, or I wouldn't be surprised to see that catch made sooner rather than later. And then the Bonacici, Larson, Cameron, Gantava group. That's going to be a great one to watch in the uh, last couple laps of racing right here. Pair of Velocity I, I Vixen said... jerseys. Claire Cameron. I'm not sure what, to, what jersey Claire Cameron is wearing in the all-black uh -huh. kit of Gantava. She's listed as a Pickle Juice Pro Cycling rider, along with her teammate Fiona Magendi. So, uh, I guess we'll call that the Pickle Juice uh, jersey. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's a, if that's an in-game jersey or if Pickle Juice has their jersey in the game here. It's Pickle Juice to me now, Brad. It's Pickle Juice to yeah, me. Yeah, I, I like it. The classic <laughs> uh, rainbow colors of Pickle Juice. All right. Yes. Yeah, so now look at that. She's showing the jersey tradition. off up on the front. Yeah. That's right. 
Cameron likes Cameron likes what she's hearing, and so she's decided to go for a ride. But Bonacici and Gontava and Larson are still holding on to her, and then we've got uh, Troyer and Magendi. As you say, I think that they're now there's about 20 meters between Troyer and Magendi, so they will probably work together. But as to whether they can close on the group of four is an open question. That's uh, there's the that's unofficial just a pickle ride juice jersey. Anyway. Yes. Nice look here from uh, from jersey. Damon at ZMS Streams. Yeah, I think this is one of the built-in RGT uh, RGT jerseys. I'll have to get that virtual jersey for myself. Have a patchwork so. look. I like it. Yeah, it's, it's almost like it's uh, got faint echoes of the uh, of the uh, Mondrian jerseys of the old Look mm -hmm. Cycling team. Mm -hmm. so, but Magendi Troyer, and Magendi Troyer together here. Yeah. In Indeed, and they've now just got 300 meters on the road to catch up to their compatriots in the group of four. And that group of four is chasing. Look at how they're riding. Look at their wattage numbers. I know they're on a descent, but this is a group that is motivated to get down the road. Right? Yeah. They, I think they have some desire that they want to get into position for these climbs. They want to get on those climbs and maybe... They are thinking, if I could just drop one more rider here, it'll make the finish a little bit simpler. So as this group of four rapidly approaches the foot of the Paterberg climb, we will find out if they try to make another selection there. And meanwhile, Godby is on the climb. So her lead has come down to 1.4k, but again, that will be only because... Uh, she is climbing and the other group is still descending so we'll get a true idea of what her real lead is once she gets over the top and when she, she does get to the be, top of that but just using the opportunity here on the way down to uh, to zero her power numbers out there a little bit on the way around so she is resting out here i mean she is finding opportunities to coast a little bit you see her coasting here on the way down using the course to her advantage as much as she can yeah, it's, uh, it's not fair to say that she's cruising to victory in the sense that she totally did the work in order to do the work. Oh, did you notice what just right. happened on our uh, second view there with uh, Gontova? It actually did show her stopping and standing for a moment on the climb. She, uh -huh. Her virtual avatar paperboyed for a second and then put a foot down. So, Yeah, that might, that might be another dropout. That might be a power dropout. Oh, just allow me my fantasies, Brad. That the, that it's actually simulated the the <laughs> real suffering of the uh, of the Paterberg climb. But getting back to the actual action at hand, Cameron is leading us up the hill. Gontova is right there with Bonacici, and they're both on the wheel. Larson showing a small but very manageable gap. I think she's showing is less than 10 meters away, but she'll have to make sure that she closes that because if they roll over the top without her, she could be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, Jenny riding like this is top. fine until they attack up up over the top. I mean, you can get gapped off and get back on pretty easily unless they roll over the top and start to attack there. So that's the risk that Larson is running here, that uh, someone in that front group of four, well, now three, will, will uh, step on the gas when they crest the top of this climb. If they don't, Larson should be fine trying to catch back on, on the descent on the way down. So a little bit of a gamble here, letting herself get gapped off, but uh, I think it should be fine. Yes, indeedy. But I think Larson is a strong enough rider, and she's demonstrated in, the, in this race as well, that uh, this group of three may want to keep her away. So they may put in a little bit of effort here. Still eight kilometers to go before the finish. So this might be an opportunity for Cameron Bonacici and Gontova to uh, turn this into a three-up race instead of a four-up yep. race. But we'll see what Larson yep. has to say about that. The gap is growing here for Larson. There's a physical element to uh, dealing with the Paderberg, and then there's the mental element that we talked about as well. Losing contact, not being able to see them up the road, that makes it a little tougher to uh, find that motivation to chase. Meanwhile, this group of two has uh, been battling it out all day. Remember, we, we saw uh, Magendi catch up to Troyer. Troyer was coming off the back of that group, and now... Agendi and Troy are locked in in this two-rider battle. Yes, indeed. 
I'm actually thinking there's something slightly interesting in, in how this group is broken up. So Troyer and Magendi are both pretty strong bike racers. Uh, I know both of them. They're uh, fairly experienced in the local cycling scene and they race for good teams. Um, Larson and Gontova, on the other hand, are both coming from substantially non-cycling backgrounds. So as we said already, Nadia Gontova is a member of the UBC rowing team. And it sounds like most of her experience is either running or virtual bicycle racing. And uh, and Holly Larson, or rather, Holly Larson is a uh, is an amateur bike racer. It's uh, there is an is a runner and an, and a virtual bike racer. And Nadia Gontova is primarily a rower in real life. So, with uh, Gontova and Larson, what we're seeing is two very strong virtual riders hanging with two very strong real riders in the form of Cameron and Bonasisi, and in fact gapping two very good real riders in Magendi and Troyer. And speaking of groups, it looks like Larson has in fact uh, lost the plot. So we are now very decisively down to a group of three, Cameron, Gontova, yeah. and Bonasisi. So just as we thought could possibly happen, Larson has not been able to close that gap after she got over the top. So that was in fact a dangerous problem for her. And it looks like Cameron Bonacisi and Gontova decided to make her pay for that. Yep. Yeah, I think they saw the opportunity here, saw a very strong rider in Larson and said, uh, we might as well get rid of her if we can, take it down to three. So we went from eight down to three, one at a time, as uh, they slowly got dropped out of the group. Meanwhile, Jackie Godby continuing to solo up the road, growing her lead to 2.2 kilometers ahead. And looks like she's on the Paderberg for the penultimate time now, as uh, she's going to get to the top of this one and start her final lap of racing here in the pro women's race. Yes, indeed. Just truly putting on a display for these virtual fans. They're cheering her on as they properly should because, of course, they're completely programmed to do so. But even if they were real human beings of flesh and blood, they should be lustily cheering on this incredible performance by Godby. She's just showing real world-class talent, both real and virtual, as she rides up the Paderberg. She's got one more ride after this before she can finish off this race. And meanwhile, her chasers are still thinking more about each other than they are about God because it really is, as we said, two groups on the road right now. There's uh, Category Godby, who's gone off and put out a two-kilometer gap in 20 kilometers of riding. And then there's Category Everybody Else, who all credible racers in their own right, but they're racing for second place at this point. I like that, the Godby category. It's like uh, how they categorize the climbs, right? The HC or uh, the race levels. The HC is all category. This will be all Godby, HG <laughs> level race out here. Beyond Godby. That's right. For video, video gamers out there, you may have heard of God tier players. Apparently, this is a Godby <laughs> tier player. Yeah, I guess she would, be a, she would definitely be a pro esports candidate uh, if there's as much money in virtual bike racing as there was in uh, Fortnite or Call of Duty or Warcraft or whatever competitive game you're playing in in the esports world sadly I think that virtual bike racing has about as much money in it as real bike racing so uh, yeah <laughs> mamas don't let your uh, sons grow up to be bike racers yeah well, let them be bike racers, but have them get a PhD in radiology while they're at it <laughs> in between. Yeah, it's good good to be able to pay the bills. Yeah, exactly. Or become an architect, something like that. Exactly. You know, have 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 something to fall back on because uh, you know, honestly, it's a precious few people who make a living at bike racing, but you can sure have a lot of fun doing it. And I think that all these riders, virtual or not, are having a lot of fun. Look at how Gontova, Bonasisi, and Cameron are racing each other as they come down this descent. I mean, it looks just as good. The weather is fantastic, because here we are in a virtual Belgium as opposed to actual British Columbia, where I can assure you that where I'm sitting, I'm looking out at the rain falling. So I'm sure that 
none of these three women is having to wear a cycling jacket in their little <laughs> indoor pain caves. They just have to enjoy the ride and hope that they've got a large enough fan blowing in their face. Yeah, the setup of the pain cave has been a fun one to watch over the last year as everyone got their individual setup kind of dialed in. Just like you, uh, everyone kind of had to pivot to work from home and you had to like build out your home office or get your desk set up wherever you're going to work from. A lot of riders had to build out their pain cave. They got their really uh, spent significant amounts of time on the trainer this year. So uh, we've been getting uh, the chance to see sort of inside a lot of these riders setups in some of these virtual races. Godby has uh, pretty much a whole setup in her living room. I mean, uh, her husband or future husband, uh, add that to her list of things that she's working on right now. They're also about to get married. So her fiance uh, also races. He's going to be racing in the pro race after this, John Cooper. And uh, they have a pretty nice setup right in the middle of their apartment in Chicago. So that's some that's some dedication to virtual racing right there. Well, that's fantastic. I got to tell you, if I... Uh... Tried to set up a uh, virtual racing system in my uh, living room. I'm pretty sure I would have to refer to myself as formerly married. Yeah. Let's let's be clear. I think this is only possible because they are both virtual racers. I don't know that there's a, a household in the world where that flies, where you don't have two virtual racers. So, <laughs> Yes, indeed, the eternal conflict. But I'm glad that all these riders are able to make it work from home. I guess they're doing the workout from home. How about you, Brad? Did you have to uh, do a uh, virtual commentary setup from home uh, all from scratch, or did you have it already? I did, built yeah. Play kit? Yeah, no, we had to we had to start building some stuff up to uh, to get into the COVID era. So I didn't uh, I didn't spend a lot of time at home. You know, I was normally on the road a lot, so it was kind of a kind of a weird change to be spending time at my desk or my office at home. But uh, yeah, I had to get the mic set up. I had to learn all about the uh, the interfaces and all that stuff. But we're dialed in now. Ah, seems like you're a quick learner, Brad, so we're all glad to hear it. Uh, Brad's probably too modest to mention it, but I've been teasing him about it a couple times. If you haven't seen his Tour to Quarantine series, which I believe is captured on YouTube, it's a fantastic bit of fake virtual racing as opposed to the real virtual racing we're watching right now. But it's uh, very entertaining. Brad simply poked a camera outside of his uh, window at the uh, bike path in Pittsburgh and... Uh, commented on the goings-on and turned it into the greatest virtual fake race I've ever seen. So, good on you, Brad. And glad to have your talents here commentating over our uh, lovely Cycling BC event today. I'm glad to be here. This is uh, obviously a legendary in-real-life event. Uh, well, all the races up in BC, but for me, BC Super Week was always, you know, one that uh, I had never been to in real life, but was always circled on my calendar. So this is really cool to get to sort of participate with you guys uh, virtually and meet some of the people and teams and riders that uh, make the racing happen up there in the in Western Canada or the Northwest, if you're in the United States, up in uh, British Columbia. Yeah, yeah it is uh, still on YouTube cascade. if you want to if you want to watch the rest of uh, Tour de Quarantine. We're also going to turn them into NFTs, and I'm going to put those on the market here pretty soon. So uh, <laughs> if you want to own an original Tour de Quarantine NFT, just keep your eyes open. Those are those are going to hit the market pretty soon. So I'm just working with uh, the regulatory agencies. They're worried that the price is going to be so high that it might crash the market. So we have to slowly release them into the marketplace. Well, I wish you the best of luck in this adventure with non-fungible tokens there, Brad. I uh, can't wait to put in a bid on the decisive stage when the, when, the ra when we learned how the race was won. Wait, can I bid on Cosmos commentary? That would be, that would be my favorite. Sure, I'll sell you Cosmos commentary. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I, guess he, I guess he has to get a cut of that. But, <laughs> okay, but only if he includes a... Uh, only if it includes a commentary on how I won the bid for the non-fungible token right. of his how, how the, the race was, was won. won of the tour to quarantine. Meanwhile, back in real virtual racing, we've got Godby continuing to increase her lead. She's out to 2.6 kilometers, and she has a mere 300 meters remaining, which means that she is, in fact, on the Petterberg climb for this final parade up the hill. The virtual Look fans... Oh my goodness, 5.3 watts. She's I think she's just held above five the entire time on this climb, the entire way up. 
Like from when she hit the the uh, cobbles to now, I don't think I've seen her drop below five watts per kilogram. That means that she is about to do like 45 seconds of five plus watts per kilogram. That is nuts. It's just monstrous. Like the raw power number is 400 watts. I mean, I can hold that, but I can hold that for about five seconds. Uh, she's been at it a lot longer than five seconds. 400 watts is... That is credible 20 minute power for some pros like some pro yeah. men so this is just these are huge numbers she's she's a world-class talent by those power numbers and by that watts per kilo and she is going to get in about 130 meters and not very many seconds a well-deserved victory here on the Peterberg in round one of the cycling bc virtual provincial championship so, chapeau, Godby. Congratulations. She's probably throwing her arms up in her living room pain cave right now as she has experienced the real joy of a virtual victory. Now she will sit and wait by the side of the road as we look back two kilometers to see where the race is going. Oh, and it's oh, going. Oh, this. Cameron finding some separation up here at the front as she gaps off Gantava here. Bonacisi has dropped back into fourth and then Larson in fifth. So uh, this is Gantava trying to hold on to Claire Cameron up the road. They got two kilometers of racing to go. That's plenty of time for Gantava here. But Gantava in the red zone trying to catch on to Cameron here. This is a long way out to be going into the red zone here, Ryan. Yeah, but everybody can see this is crucial action. I mean, these gaps are not going to have time to come back together. We're 2K to go, and I know for sure that Cameron is too savvy a rider to be putting herself into actual difficulty. So this is a real 60-meter gap, and this will be the race. I think that both Gontova and Bonacisi, who is also falling behind, have to think very hard about entering the pain cave and pretty much committing to staying there for two long kilometers. Cameron, meanwhile, at the front, one and a half K to go. She's descending rapidly and she's going to hit the bottom of the Paderberg any moment, but her gap is up to 200 meters over Contova. I think that Claire Cameron is going to be able to parade up to a fairly solid fairly assured second place here in this race today and it's just a question yeah, no, of whether or not Guntova. go ahead i was going to say this was a group of four up until the last lap of racing i mean these four pretty much stayed together until let's say four kilometers to go when we uh, really started to see that separation so they have been uh, keeping the powder dry throughout the day today but this uh, this group stayed together for an impressively long time in that battle for second place behind jackie godby yeah, I'm also interested, though, that uh, Cameron and presumably Gontova as well decided to make their move from this far out. They were clearly neither was satisfied to find out uh, if they could just drop their uh, competitors on the final climb. Claire wanted to make it decisive before she had to get to the uh, bottom of the Paderberg. So looks like her tactics are going to work out because she still has a 100 meter gap over Gontova. That'll rubber band a little bit as Cameron is on the climb now and Guntova isn't yet, but despite that rapidly shrinking gap, I think that Cameron is very comfortably going to take second place and Guntova, unless she goes absolutely out of her mind on this climb, will have to settle for third. Picking up some lap traffic here on the way up. <laughs> that is still Cameron up the road. That's right. So this is the race for second place. The gap is uh, 60 meters, so not invisible. That really is Cameron that Guntova is seeing in the distance. But with only 300 meters to go, even on these incredible climbs, I think that this has been decided. Cameron is tapping out the wattage. You can see her going over 5 watts per kilo up this climb. She's keeping a pretty steady 280 watts. Probably her goal wattage as she rolls up here. Though now she's peeking out. She's on the steepest part of the slope, 20% grade, and she's peaking at 350 watts. So this will be her little sprint to get over this top part of the uh, climb. And then as she flattens out, she will just have a 
tiny 150 meters or so before she can cruise to the finish line. So and remember, for some reference, right around five watts per kilogram was what Jack Godby was doing on the way up. Cameron is touching five watts per kilogram every once in a while, but she's kind of hovering around four and a half. So gives you a little bit of reference to uh, the power numbers between Godby and Cameron here on the way up the final time. And those are accurate numbers because it's watts per kilogram. It's a ratio based on your power and the weight that that power has to push up the hill. So it's a good uh, comparison number in the watts per kilogram category as Claire Cameron going to hit the line for second place today. Great ride for the Canadian. She'll find second place in the virtual BC Cup today. That's right. And she's going to be, she's being chased up the hill by Nadia Gontova. So Nadia uh, has an American flag over her uh, head, but she is a local in the sense that she races for the UBC rowing team. So I'm going to take it that she must be a student at the University of British Columbia. And congratulations, she put in a powerful ride today. Third place in the company that she is keeping at the moment is a very credible result. And my old friend Angie Bonacisi, I actually went to school with her uh, brother-in-law James. So uh, I've, I haven't known Angie for way back, but I have this weird connection. But she's a fantastic person. As I said, great contributor to local cycling as well. She'll take fourth place, which would mean something if this was a mountain bike race but alas it's a road race and holly larson the last of our group of four that was together for so long on this race is crawling up the petterberg and it looks like magendi and troy are going to have a legit yeah. race here for six and seven all right i think we're going to have something to talk about brad oh magendi's yep. made her move Troy are able to respond, though. She's there, covers the gap. This might be the best two-up finish of the day here between Magendi and Troyer. Yeah, they are, it may be only honor that's on the line, but they've got a lot of honor that they're fighting for right now. Troyer has closed the gap. Is she going to come around? Oh, Magendi oh. counterattacks. Oh, man. See how Troyer went into the green zone there? You can't do that on this climb. Uh, she thought she had made contact, and Troyer was like, oh, I'm here. I'm just going to grab a little bit of rest. But on the finishing climb on this Paderberg, you just can't do that. You have to stay red line the entire time. Uh, so I think just a little slip up there from Troyer. Magendi took advantage of it, stayed on the attack, and I think that's going to give her the winning gap of the day. But what a wonderful attack and counterattack. And now we're watching with... Uh as Larson has gotten over the uh, Paderberg and she's coming to the finish. Fifth place for Larson. Well done. And then we've got Magendi and Troyer. You know, no shame for either of these riders. Look at how close contact they came. Remember that Pam Troyer started out this race by hanging with our winner, uh, Godby, for so long before she blew up. And maybe she's paid the price in the end, but... She did a lot to activate this race at the start, so she, full credit to her. Maybe we should give Pam the red numbers for today's uh, race for the most combative rider. But right now we're watching Fiona Magendi. She won her little battle with Pam, and so she will take sixth place. And, like and Troy, you've got to give credit. some credit for at least trying the attack, you know? I mean, uh, at least tried to get up there with Godby. She wasn't intimidated to try to hang with her early on. And I'm wondering if Troyer maybe learns a little bit today and gets ready for round two and says, like, all right, if I let off a little earlier, if I, you know, if I don't go so hard early on, maybe I can move up into the top five, try and hang with that group. So uh, we'll keep an eye on Troyer over the next few weeks of racing here in the virtual BC Cup as she wraps up seventh place out in our Pro Cat one women but uh, Jackie Godby dominating out there today as looks like just about everybody in and done on the Paderberg so it's going to uh, take us down to the final race of the day getting ready for our pro men coming up next as Godby crushes it with a 4.4 watt per kilo average Claire Cameron comes in just over four watts per kilo average at uh, in second place and then Nadia Gantova into third at 49 minutes with a 4.16 average watts per kilo. These are all really impressive numbers here, Ryan. I mean, these are great rides today. Big, big numbers from big riders. It was a small field, but you can see that every one of them came out to win. And I mean, Godby was clearly the class here, but we saw some excellent racing all the way down, even to sixth and seventh place when we had Fiona and Pamela just trading hammer and tongs. Uh, 
on the final climb of the Paderberg to try and uh, to try and make that last position. So I had a lot of fun watching this, and I hope that all of our audience did as well. Yeah, well, this was uh, one of the best of the day in our pro women's race. Still got one more coming up here in the virtual BC Cup. That is the pro men scheduled for 12 noon local time, Pacific time. So that is about 35 minutes from right now. So uh, we'll step back here and take a short break and be back with you about 15 minutes before the start. We'll pick up coverage for the pro men at the virtual BC Cup as we wrap up our pro women. Congratulations to Jackie Godby. And we'll be right back with coverage of our pro men in about 20 minutes.
And welcome back as we get into our final race of the day here at the Virtual BC Cup after a dominant performance from Jackie Godby in the Pro Women. It's time for the Pro Men to take to the course. Brad Cerner here with Ryan Cousineau as we get ready for uh, day one of the Virtual BC Cup here. Ryan, this is the first of four days of racing that Cycling BC is going to be hosting. And I got to say, if the last three days are anything like the first day, I'm pretty excited for what uh, the next three stops of the Virtual BC Cup hold. I hear you, Brad. Uh, we've got uh, one more race today to look forward to, but yeah, we're going to be doing a different course uh, each weekend for uh, the remainder of this series. But uh, what we've got to look forward to right now, in a, starting in about 10 minutes, will be the Elite Men's category. And they will be racing on this delightful course we've seen a couple times already this morning, which is the Paderberg. It's a four kilometer loop with uh, a real zesty climb to finish it off. You can just see it being drawn in there on our virtual map. This is a, a real a virtual version of a real course in the uh, lovely land of Belgium, home of bike racing. And that course is that hill at the end is going to be what really defines this race on every lap. 
Yeah, it seems to have been the uh, the common denominator in all the races so far today that we see groups that form, we see groups that are riding together, but we just haven't got that battle on the Paderborn yet because uh, the strong riders have been able to separate themselves for the most part out there today. But we've got some really strong guys in this pro men's field, a little bigger field, I think, than uh, the other races that we've seen today. So we'll see if that uh, changes the way that this race plays out. A lot of times when you have just more riders in there, that can... Uh, that can change the dynamic a little bit out there. Uh, Ryan, a lot of names I recognize on this list from the Echelon Racing League. Now, there's going to be some uh, some pretty impressive crossover between our Canadian riders, our BC riders, and the Echelon Racing League riders. So I'm going to start with Matt Usborne because I think that's the biggest name that sticks out to me from the ERL. But Matt, also a big part of Cycling BC. Uh, yes, absolutely. He may be the most ambitious crossover in virtual cycling. He is a force in real local cycling BC racing, although uh, I know how he compares with some of these other local riders, so it'll be interesting to see whether they can turn their uh, in real life ability into virtual success here. Some of the local riders that I see on this list that I think are really worth uh, keeping track of, we've got uh, young Manu Moore, uh, my close personal teammate, who's now racing for the Red Truck Racing Team on the road this year. Um, we've got uh, a few others, like uh, I think Oliver Dowd, you would know from uh, your side in virtual racing, but the couple of names that stand out for me are Alexander Fraser Moran, aka AFM, another red truck rider, and his teammate Alex Murison. So the two Alexes are both local riders of great success and great ability, and I think they will be factors in this morning's race. Again, we're going to be looking for the experienced riders and then the new riders because I think that's what uh, the virtual BC Cup really has to offer here, bringing new quality Canadian BC riders into the virtual racing mix here to give these, uh, let's call them veterans of virtual racing, a little run for their money. So uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing some of these new names out here going up against guys that we've seen racing a lot like Matt Usborne. Usborne comes with a lot of experience on his team as well. He's riding for the Above and Beyond Cancer presented by Bike World Team. He's going to be racing with Randy Reichert, Hayden Warner, and Timmy Bauer today. All three guys I know from uh, from the other virtual racing that we've been doing this year. So there are uh, four very strong riders in those white, green, and yellow kits of the Above and Beyond Cancer team but there's also a lot of sort of one-off riders in this field that uh, i think will have a good go at it oliver dowd we talked about for the restart racing team the 24 year old i think will uh, certainly be in the mix at uh, throughout the race today so i'm going to be keeping an eye on dowd and then chris naven is the coach of jackie godby who uh, we just watched finish up the pro women's race uh, dominating the pro women's race so naven knows a little something about power and how to use it and then john cooper the fiance of jackie godby also in this one as well, racing for the Triple X Atletico squad. So, uh, again, good mix of uh, our our pros and amateurs out there as we get into just over six minutes away from racing. I want to take this time to go a little bit further in depth with some of our riders and meet some of our riders in the pro men's race. Campbell Parrish, Above and Beyond Cancer, presented by Bike World. I'm 16. I've been racing bikes since I've, I was about eight years old. I'd like to say I'm an all-rounder because um, I like to do all the disciplines, track, road, cross, cross-country, mountain bike, occasionally some enduro. I'm a bit of a taller guy, around 6'4", 6'5", so I do like my time trials, but you know, I just like to do it all. I just like to be competitive because I have some more experience on RGT and I'd like to give the elite riders in BC a challenge. Fiona Magendi, Red Truck, Canada. Started biking about 18 months ago. I do love climbing, uh, especially longer climbs. Working on the higher end power, uh, <laughs> sprinting still got some ways to go. I'd really like to see if I can improve my sort of racing on virtual platforms. RGT looks pretty interesting. Um, I know there are different technical things that you have to be aware of but then also working with a team and see if i can work on some of my strengths and then help out the team that i'm on um, try and get some wins there i'm oliver dowd i'm 24 years old racing for restart racing my riding strength is uphill sprinting and when it comes to watts per kilo anything like a minute and under is 
than in my real house. My new more. I'm racing for Cannondale. I'm 16. I've been racing bikes for a while, since I was, I think, 11. I would say I'm more of a climber. I'm not, I'm not amazing at very steep climbs, but very long, gradual climbs like Seymour or Cyprus, I'm, I'm pretty good at, yeah. I can do a bit of GC if the time trials aren't very long. Time trials are not my strength. Um, doing decent in GC and doing well in climbs. I'm John Heimlein. I'm 31 years old and I race for Prada Echelon, based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. I've been in real life racing for about five and a half, six years now. I'd love to call myself an all-arounder. I'm a little on the bigger side, so definitely more of a sprinter. Um, in the esports world, I've definitely have grown, really trying to finish it out strong. Definitely trying to shoot for a couple results here before uh, the end of the esports season. Peter Olenicek, I am 28 years old. I am in Minnesota. United States of America, and I race for Project Echelon Racing. Most people would consider me an all-rounder, primarily because I um, have some pretty decent time trialing abilities, pretty decent sprint abilities, but also, um, you know, have the ability to make the breakaway, sprint from the breakaway, and be a pretty all-around versatile rider. My goal is to ride more efficiently and had a couple fourth place finishes looking to make the podium uh randy reichardt with above and beyond cancer powered by bike world and i am the ripe age of 40. i started in my late 20s when i was in college that was about 19 years ago i like short punchy um courses circuits are my favorite because you can really kind of play out different advantageous roles throughout that course timmy bauer i'm in northern california I'm 28 years old, and this year I'm racing for Above and Beyond Cancer Racing. I signed up for my first race in the spring of 2015 and was hooked from there on. I'm not specifically good at one thing, but I'm, I'm really good at a lot of things. Um, yeah, um, definitely just support my teammates, help my teammates. That's really rewarding to me. Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to get a podium out of a breakaway. I'm Zach Nair. I'm 24, racing for Project Echelon Racing on the Road started back when I was 17. I'm probably more of an all-rounder, 10, 20 minutes over and over for four hours. That's definitely my thing. I have a, a Saris H3 trainer, um, and then I also have their MP1 platform. My goal is to be on the top step of the podium. <laughs> Ryan, sounds like there is a common theme among all those riders. It's that nobody really knows what style of rider they are on RGT. Everyone said, I'm kind of an all-arounder, but, or I'm kind of a good sprinter, but it all changes when you get onto RGT. So it's been really interesting watching the crossover from these riders that we know from in real life racing and see how they do on the virtual platforms. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I mean, we were talking about what kind of riders are going to succeed here today. The Paterberg climb that defines this course is a punchy climb, but it's probably not quite long enough to completely exclude the sort of sprinty power riders that are so that so often do well in the classics anyways, right? Not pure time trial. It's just riders who can put out a couple of minutes of power with uh, great force and effort and do so repeatedly. Um, all these riders are copying to being all-rounders. I think the real answer is that they're pretty good riders who, in a lot of the local fields that they face, are probably able to win a race just about any way that they want to. Yeah. Yeah, they can win all round, I guess is the way to say it for a lot of these riders. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, like a guy like Peter Olenicek says, like, I'm a decent time trialist, but he's a top 20 time trialist, uh, you know, nationally speaking, if you're talking about domestic riders that are still racing here in the U.S. So it's uh, it's easy to underplay your ability, I guess, when you're asked to talk about your skills on camera. Maybe just trying to, you know, put a little poker face out there, say, I'm, I'm not good at anything. Don't Don't worry about me. Don't chase me down in a breakaway. I'm not a threat. Don't worry, guys. You can just let me go. No problem. I think uh, most of these riders in here will know the other riders because they've probably raced against each other at some point. If you're on the sort of domestic elite circuit between uh, Canada and the U.S., you've probably 
cross paths with a lot of these guys at some point. So underway in racing for our pro men doing eight laps around the 4.2 mile circuit. So uh, we'll see how long that takes. Some should be right around hour and a half, somewhere around there. So this will be our longest race of the day at eight circuits, but also our biggest field. So we'll see if that propels the guys down any faster. So, yeah, it looks like we've got about uh, 15, 16 riders starting, and we're seeing the traditional uh, virtual cycling quick takeoff where the group is all jockeying to make sure that they are not left out of that initial lead field you know, they start at full wattage as we talked about with the earlier races and they'll stay at that until there's some form of a selection so that nobody gets left behind and right now the action looks like it's being well it's being led by manu moore my close personal teammate he's a young rider i think he's only 16 or 17 and so he's showing well at the uh, front of this field, making sure that he's uh, not going to get dropped, but hopefully not doing too much work. It actually seems like a pretty calm group up here at the front. These guys doing a nice job of not uh, not blowing up too early, as is the case with a lot of uh, new riders on our GT. So a uh, nice steady pace being set in here. I'm seeing numbers like three or four watts per kilogram, which is well within the threshold capabilities of these riders. I mean, that's not, I mean, none of them will have any trouble maintaining this for a good long time. So this is all about just not getting dropped. And I think they've all succeeded at that. And probably once we, you know, get through these opening kilometers, the race may settle down into its true composition. So. Much as we saw with the earlier fields, I think what we'll see is uh, we've seen the initial sorting out. Nobody got dropped, so everybody's happy about that. And we've done about uh, one and a half kilometers at this course, and right about the 3.8 kilometer mark, they are going to run into the bottom of the Paterberg for the first time. And then we will see if there is any selection being made at that point. Yeah, it looks like now, we're calling this, I think that's 15 in this group, I'm trying to look at the gaps over on the left-hand side. It's at least 14 in here. But uh, I, I just want to know the number because I want to know what the number is after they climb the Paderberg for the first time. I'm guessing it's going to be a couple less than whatever number that they start with is. So I think we're going to call this 16 in this group with the uh, Froserman going to be the last one tacked onto the back here. So that's the magic number. We're going to start at 16, but uh, we'll be tracking that number throughout the day, and it's going to get smaller and smaller over the next hour or so. Yeah, that's uh, Alex Fraser Moran. I'm afraid that the interface is uh, mutilating his uh, lovely hyphenated last name uh, in a fairly cruel way, but I believe he's racing here with his brother. Uh, Alex, you can just refer to him as AFM, which will make our lives a lot easier. And he's got his brother, I believe that's uh, Declan. No, uh, I think it's Derek Fraser Moran, a.k.a. DFM, who is also racing my apologies to Daniel Fraser Moran, who will be the other Fraser Moran that we should see in this field, if I'm right. The FM brothers. That's right. AFM like and it. DFM. So we're just at about two and a half kilometers. They seem to have... Well, I can't say they've settled down because it looks calm, but we've got one rider off the front. We've got big wattage numbers. In that field. Yeah, this is Timmy Bauer, Above and Beyond Cancer, presented by Bike World, taking a look off the front. Now, get used to this jersey. This is, uh, again, Above and Beyond Cancer, white, green, and a little bit of yellow on there. I think you're going to see these jerseys a lot because this team has been known to attack specifically on RGT. Uh, they're not afraid to put riders up the road. Uh, between Bauer, I think we're going to see Matt Usborne attack at some point today. Probably every rider, actually, I would guess, on this Above and Beyond Cancer roster for today is is uh, going to be spending some time off the front at least. Uh, they're just not happy to sit back and let things kind of chill. So uh, a lot of times they are the ones that will start these breakaways. Here's another guy that I know well from virtual racing, Bruce Bird. This is another really strong solo rider who's not afraid to take some risks, not afraid to get into a breakaway. So if these guys were hoping that uh, it was going to be an easy day today, the addition of, of Above and Beyond Cancer and Bruce Bird from Draft Racing are going to be uh, a few names on that start list that will make this race tough. So like all of these riders, Bruce was asked to uh, submit a bio for this race. His bio says that he loves cycling, and I guess he's proving it as we speak. 
Meanwhile, we're watching this race as it comes close to the uh, bottom of the Paterberg. Additional commentary is being provided by a very bad dog in the background here. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's Pinter. We'll try to keep him off the commentary as much as possible. He's a bit Pinter, willful. I like it. Yes. He's named after the uh, playwright uh, Harold Pinter because my lovely bride nice. was very insistent that we have a dog with a literary name. <laughs> he's not really as, as smart as his name. A dog, like, though. He's... A dog of culture. I like it. Uh, yeah, he can't read. That's the truth of it. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the front of the field, it looks like as as you predicted, we've got the above and beyond cancer jerseys showing well. There's uh, four riders from that team, if I've got my numbers right. We've got Timmy Bauer. Hayden Warner, Randy Reichardt, and Matus Born. And Man, they're putting some pressure on the back of the group here. Remember, 16 was the number, and it looks like Kelly might be our first casualty out of the back of the group here. Yes, the Paterberg shows no mercy, and this uh, elite men's field shows even less. Matt Usborn putting up a little gap. He's got about 10 meters as he goes through the finish line for the first time. He's being chased down by Kersey from the Tag Cycling Club. Tag Cycling's a local team that does uh, youth development and uh, are pretty good at it. I believe that would be Brendan Kersey. Sorry, Braden Kersey. I'm going to just misread everybody's name today. He's from the lovely land of Vernon, B.C. in the interior of British Columbia. And apparently he's a triathlete who loves climbs. Curious combination there, Brad. Hmm. Hmm. I've never heard of that before. That just, well, we will find out what young Braden can do with this strange combination of abilities. Only 19 years old, he's got lots of time left in this race and lots of time left in his life to show us what it is like to be a hill-climbing triathlete. Yeah, he just doesn't know that he hates climbing yet. He just hasn't had the chance to realize how much climbing can suck sometimes as a triathlete. Well, it may not a lot be of real, but he's going to get Go ahead. I was going to say, a lot of times they come over to road racing, it's like, man, this is a lot easier with these drop bars, you know, when you're not on a time trial bike, uh, trying to be out to either on the, the time trial bars or out on the drops of a TT bar. I know that what a lot of road racers like most about triathletes when they first see them come into the sport is their uh, tactical acumen, by which I mean triathletes often provide an excellent lead out if you're going into a sprint right the uh, the bulldozer approach to sprinting yeah <laughs> i see alex murison getting slightly gapped that is real danger perhaps he has not been putting in enough trainer time in this year off because he should be the class of this field or certainly not getting dropped earlier than a lot of these other riders not sure what's going on there but murison in big trouble real early we'll see if he can get back on Maybe it's just a trainer glitch. Keep an eye on his power numbers, see if they come back up. Meanwhile, pressure's starting to lift here. Even on the way down, these guys are uh, going into the yellow, orange. You see Hayden Warner in the red zone there for a little bit. So they are uh, pushing the tempo. Timmy Bauer back up on the front. Bruce Bird in the mix as well. As uh, they tap things out here at 27.7K to go. Yes, but with few exceptions, it is Grupo Compacto. Ah, we're being shown in Alex again. Him and uh, Mr. Kelly have both exited this race a little early, but uh, yeah, Murison not showing very impressive numbers in terms of his wattage. He's capable of so much more, so something's wrong there. I'm not sure what. Maybe yeah. he's just having a jour sans, as the French would say. <laughs> it could be a miscalibrated trainer. could be an issue with uh, some sort of technical element of getting the power into the system or maybe you lose contact and it's like what's the point man like what's the point of trying to go four watts per kilogram when i've already lost contact lost the group maybe he's just gonna cut his losses and uh, try and get in a get in a training right after today look at this massive wattage 5.3 5.5 i saw 5.7 on there for these guys up at the front they are pushing it timmy bauer keeping the pressure on for these guys that's right. This is punitive racing. They're on a little one of the smaller climbs in the middle of this circuit. So this isn't the big Paterberg, but clearly it's enough that some of these riders are putting in the effort and making a selection happen. But we've still got about a group of uh, 
goes all the way down to Fraser Moran, a group of most of the riders. I'm guessing we've still got, we said 16 to start, so we're probably at 14 unless we've lost someone else on the way. Uh, Bauer, another one of the, uh, another one of the above and beyond riders uh, leading this field. He's got Navin and Cooper right at the front, but, and it looks like those three have created a small gap now. So yeah. they're being chased down by Kersey, Bird, et al. Let's see if that gap can hold or not. Oh, this is the Jackie Godby entourage up on the front. Cooper, her fiance, and Navin, her coach, both riding for Triple X Racing, a uh, club based out of Chicago, Illinois. And they're going to be joined here by Bruce Bird, Timmy Bauer, and the rest of them. So uh, that'll shut that breakaway down. So we keep an eye on Bruce Bird working his way here. Here comes Frazier Moran up to the front. Might be a good chance for a counterattack here. It'll be some tired legs up on the front. Try and use the course to your advantage a little bit here on the way down. But uh, it's going to be really tough to get away from a very strong group and a very experienced group on RGT here. There are, uh, I would say, more than half of the riders in this group of what is now, uh, let's say, 12 riders, 13 riders left. Uh, I would say at least eight of these guys nine of these guys have significant experience on rgt so it'll be a little disadvantage for the newer riders in this group yeah there's been lots of big legs and lots of big brains being brought into the four here they're at 7.9 kilometers which means they are onto the paterberg and they're showing no mercy look at how quick these riders are going up the paterberg it just becomes a different kind of effort when you're riding this fast and when they're riding in a group all of a sudden draft effects matter they're still doing 20 kilometers an hour on a 10 percent grade i can assure you i don't do 20 kilometers an hour on an any percent grade but we will see what happens when they get to the 20 percent that this peaks out at they're hitting the wall right now and they're hitting the wall speeds yeah. have dropped down to 10 kilometers an hour in this virtual world usborne on the front closely coupled group there are at least 11 or 12 riders in here all the usual suspects that we've been talking about are still right there Osborne pulling it over the top he's got his teammate Warner right behind him I see my close personal teammate Manu Moore is back there in seventh uh, we've got it listed as R. Ivani in fourth I think that's actually Karsten Ivani if I'm not mistaken uh, he rides locally for the giant Vancouver team and he's another pretty young rider well, I guess not that right young Actually, I wonder if there's two Ivani's because that's the older Ivani he's about 40 no spring chicken hmm. who's born getting up there yeah. as well he's probably one of the older riders in this field I would I would say not to put uh, Matt yes, in a and... corner here but uh, by my math he is the second oldest rider in this field um, I know that uh, he's he's doing well for a man of his age, that is for sure. And yeah. uh, certainly, if having read his rider bio, I also know that he thinks he's quite funny. <laughs> we've uh, we've done some interviews with him in the in the echelon recently. I can confirm that he, uh, yeah, we we poked some fun at him and he poked the fun back. So it was uh, <laughs> it was fun having him in the ERL. Bruce Burr, the guy here in second place, is the oldest rider in this race at 50. Two years old for draft racing. Bird is actually a Grand Fondo world champion. Back in uh, 2017, he went to the world champ, uh, the Fondo World Championships in Albi, France, and won his age group there. When he was 41, he uh, became the uh, Fondo world champion. So pretty cool for Bruce. He still rocks his uh, rainbow jersey hat when he. Uh, when he races on the trainer, we had some cameras on him for the Echelon Racing League. So uh, a Fondo world champion up here at the front in Bruce Bird. Well, chapeau to Bruce. As much as I'd like to make fun of being a Grand Fondo world champion, that's a legit event, which is very hotly contested. It's a kind of an interesting thing the UCI did, which is effectively they substituted that for what used to be the Masters Road World. And I th think they did a good thing by doing so because they've gotten some great competitive fields and some great big fondo events but meanwhile hey, we're Bert, a, uh, this year yeah go ahead i was just going to say he qualified for that based on the in you know you have to qualify in a real life race qualified at the gray mountain road race uh which took place near collingwood i guess that was the only qualifier that year in canada so 
he was able to uh, make it there, get the result, and that got him the invite to race at the World Championships. That's right. There's a couple of um, of major fondos that happen in uh, BC, including the Valley Fondo, and also um, even more famously the Grand Fondo Whistler. Uh, that latter event, I think, may have been pegged to be uh, a World Championship event at some point, and may have been intended to be a qualifier as well in 2020. But uh, we all know how 2020 went. Nobody knows what's going on anymore. I don't. Nobody knows how to qualify for anything. That's right. Uh, We're going to be figuring it out here pretty soon, though. Well, yeah. Perhaps at this point it'll be just show up, and uh, we'll call that qualifying. <laughs> but we're seeing a we'll sort it out uh, hot and heavy racing here, aren't we? Yeah, I'm actually surprised how I've... intense this has been early on. I thought these guys were going to uh, sort of make the selection and then chill for a little bit, but I think Above and Beyond Cancer came into this one with a plan, and uh, it did not involve chilling, let's say. No, certainly not. I'm not sure it involved having this many people in the peloton at this point, or at least oh, probably at intended that they what establish a break. Yeah, we've got the gapped group now. So that's E.P. Sosnowski, Monsieur Tavlanche, and my old personal teammate, Manu Moore, all trying to regain contact. They are about 200 meters behind uh, the main peloton, so that is a big and problematic gap for that uh, trio that's working together and meanwhile I can see that Murison is about two kilometers back and he's now at zero watts per kilogram so I'm afraid that we're going to have to wave goodbye to Murison my yeah. uh, my early bet for a ride for Danger Man here he has DNF'd but Morrison now more and Terblanche yeah, go ahead. Yeah, over here on the right-hand side, I'm watching more uh, yo-yo back and forth. If he understood the platform a little bit better, I think more looks like he has the numbers to be in the group. But the way that he was riding in this group of three makes me think that uh, he's he's wasting some energy out there. He's losing some watts on efficiency in riding in the group. So I'm wondering if that's what caused him to lose contact with uh, that front group initially. If uh, maybe it was just a, a lapse of attention, uh, an, at uh, an attack on the front, maybe one of those above and beyond cancer surges and it just got caught off guard a little bit because it, it looks like the numbers are there for more, but uh, just uh, the riding on RGT is not quite matching up. Yeah, that's very possible. Moore and Terre Blanche are both young riders, so it wouldn't surprise me if they were just caught out by that. E.P. Sosnowski is old enough to know better, but he's also heavy enough that he probably just can't do the watts per kilo that the sharp end of this group has done. So hopefully these three riders can work together as much as they can. Sosnowski will provide the watts on the descent, or at least a draft, and maybe they've still got a chance of making contact, but that gap is... Uh, uh, that gap is getting big. Yeah. I don't know if they're going to come back today. So we may be looking at our sort of, what would this be now? I think it's a group of 11 at the front. And they're being led Maven by Watson. tacked on to the back. And Watson at the front. Yeah. On to the Paderberg <laughs> one more time. And, away and there go. goes Watson. Right out the back. Yeah. I think he was, uh, that's a classic sag climbing move. Get to the front of yeah. a hill that you think is going to cause you trouble and then yep. move to the back of the field as you go up the hill so that you never lose contact with the group. You're basically giving yourself a head start if you don't think you're as good a climber on a little lumpy hill like this. Look so at Naven and a... Cooper, the two Triple uh, X Racing teammates. They've been together all day. Uh, I notice every time I see Naven, Cooper's right there in the red jersey of Triple X Racing. So it seems like they're really sticking together. The Above and Beyond Cancer guys are kind of dividing and conquering today it's like you go off the front and come back next guy goes off the front you come back triple x the uh, the pair of triple x riders is just kind of sitting in but they're staying with each other which uh, i think is really hard to do in uh, virtual racing here yeah and it'll be interesting to see sort of how who's reacting and who's chasing down those attacks by the uh, uh by the above and beyond team uh, we were talking earlier about how RGT has some simulation in its virtual world of uh, difficulties with moving through the pack. Um, do you think we're seeing some of that as we go up the Paderberg, which is, as in real life, a, an especially narrow climb? Perhaps we are. But look at this. It's Matt Usborne coming over and coming over through with about a 17-meter gap. 
Uh, let's watch his wattage numbers. That'll give us an indication of whether or not he's intending to open this gap up or not. I don't think he's trying very hard because uh, Bruce Bird has a lot more wattage in his chase of Osborne. And indeed, Matt is going to get caught and he's very happy to be caught. AFM third place and then we've got Mr. Kersey from Tag Cycling, Brandon I think, or Braden rather. And he will make this a group of four. But with the chasing field only a few meters behind, I'm pretty sure we'll regroup to Grupo Compacto before we are yep. done. Yeah, it seems like the, this is a familiar scenario playing out. There's like a pseudo attack that goes off the front, and there's separation. And one by one, the riders come back into the group, but eventually somebody gets left out. They're not able to cover that gap to move it. So it's not like these attacks uh, are, are forming off the front. It's guys like this, John Cooper, very strong rider. He was in that mix. We just talked about him a couple minutes ago. I was talking about how he was riding with his teammate in the group, right, being locked in with Chris Navin on the way in there. But they were at the back. There was that surge on the climb, and Cooper wasn't able to get back in. He just wasn't able to chase back on. So uh, minus one out of the group, and it looks like Oliphant might be the next one. And then there were ten, but Oliphant would make it, and then there were nine. Oh. Yeah, it looks like indeed uh, Oliphant has a pretty big cap to the group of nine ahead of him, so that may become insurmountable very quickly. We've got Oliphant and Cooper in no man's land, and then we've got our group of three, Terre Blanche, Sosnowski, and Moore off the back. So we're down to a group of nine making the race at the front, as we see. Terre Blanche, Sosnowski, and Moore are actually at least working well together. We'll see if that yeah. gap starts to close, but they've got their work cut out for them. They're about 600 meters, I think, back, if not more, from the pack. Now we're back at the front of the field where we can see Navin going off. And he's looking good doing it. Uh, here's my close personal friend, AFM, Alex Fraser Moran. A good, strong local rider. Uh, showing his nose at the front of the field and taking some wind. And I think AFM is going to be our, uh, our hometown favorite in this group, right? I guess that's as close <laughs> as we're going to get to a local favorite uh, in this front group. So we'll put oh, yeah, him down right. as the hometown we'll hero. Claim... I was going to say we'll claim Matt as one of our own as well, but um, is, I guess Matt is still in that group, but it sure is yeah. looking like uh, AFM is sort of the, he's the lone wolf here who I don't think he has a teammate there anymore either. There were a few tread truck riders, but I'll bet you their protected rider was uh, who <laughs> was probably Alex Murison. And we've already yeah. seen Thomas Terblanche, the other red truck rider. And the problem with Thomas is he's uh way back so if he's going to get it done i believe <laughs> there we've got cooper no oh, cooper may be catching oliphant so these two may be coming together as a group and uh i don't know if they can make it back but they're still only 160 meters from the lead group so they've got a chance if they work real hard but there's a lot of power in that lead group yeah and we'll see if afm can hold them off Cooper going forward, Oliphant going backwards, and uh, I think they're going to meet in the middle somewhere in between there and try and press on in the 10th and 11th positions out on course. And uh, again, it's up to nine up at the front. They have really quickly taken this group down from uh, the original 16. It's like the cliff notes of 10 Little Indians. They just skipped right to <laughs> nine. Yeah, they're trying. There's a couple of them now trying for, and then there were two. It's uh, Bruce Bird right. and Ivani going hammer and tongs, and they've got a small gap, but it looks like Power and Newsborn would really like them to not have any gap at all. So now we're reading the novel backwards, and then there were five. Group's getting bigger. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, Above and Beyond Cancer is probably, we talked about some of the teammates in this group, riders that had teammates like uh, Watson you see here for Hugh Dog Racing is starting to move up. I think Above and Beyond Cancer has been the only team that has really figured out how to leverage numbers in these races uh, on RGT because it's really hard to do. It's really difficult to organize it and to know how to use those numbers. You can put six guys in a group, but if, if you don't know how to use those six guys to your advantage to either 
make it as difficult as possible for the other riders to protect your star rider. Whatever your strategy is to use those, uh, those riders, I think Above and Beyond Cancer has the best one. And their strategy is make it as hard as possible at the front. Use every rider you have to keep the tempo hard, make it make the pace very high, and then see who's left at the end. But uh, right now it's Usborne and Bauer making this one as tough as possible. Yeah, and they're making it plenty tough. Apologies, there's a little guest commentary there by Pinter. But meanwhile, Usborne is showing everybody how the Paterberg climb works. But we can see this group is, cha is still... We've got a group of nine, uh, if you go all the way down to AFM. But uh, it's a beautiful camera angle where we can see exactly how the Paterberg is selecting this race. So... Look at a guy like AFM sitting there just dangling off the back. This is his race, if he can hold with this group or not, right? And the only problem he's got is this is lap, uh, they're just completing lap four now, and so they've got about four laps to go. So he's I'm led do this to believe, a bunch more times. I would think that, that he's kind of comfortable where he is. He was in the, the orange-yellow zone up until just now. He moved into the red zone. So it seemed like he wasn't really panicking yet, but now that he's starting to see the, the elastic slowly being pulled, he's like, all right, I do have to do a red zone effort here. But for the most part, it seems like Frazier Moran is, uh, is not really focused on keeping that power as high as possible. He seems like uh, he's comfortable or confident that he'll be able to get back into this group or maybe... He's already on the, on the edge of blowing up here. Yeah, it's uh, if it's a tactic, it's a curious tactic. I'm not sure if that's the way I would ride that uh, part of this course. On the other hand, if I was riding this course, I wouldn't be where Alex was. I'd be. Well, we'll know really quickly behind. if he gets into the red zone here. Then we'll know that that was uh, maybe a a tactical approach the way up. But he's staying blue and green here, so I think Fraser Moran might have cracked here on uh, that yeah. time up the Paderberg. I think AFM is in difficulty, as they say. Usborne, no difficulty whatsoever. He is hammering out the pedals. He's making Dude, it I look love easy. This. Look at this. Usborne yeah. and Bird, the two oldest guys in the race, showing the kids how it's done. <laughs> oh, age and guile, Brad. It's age and guile. Meanwhile, we've got who I think is Karsten Ivani chasing them down along with two more of the... Uh, Two more of Matt's teammates on the, uh, yeah. and uh, who else have we got there? Oh, Kersey from the tag cycling team. So we've got, uh, Kersey is now, I think, Kersey and Ivani would be sort of our remaining uh, locals along with us born. So lots to look forward to and lots to cheer for if you're uh, rooting for someone from BC to win this race. And indeed... If we if we just adopt Bruce Bird, he may be from back east, but he's still got a Canadian flag beside his name. We'll take it. Close enough. How big can <laughs> Canada be? Yeah, by population, Toronto, quite small indeed. Vancouver. What's the difference? It's, yes, uh, yes, uh, a popular opinion in Canada. I can assure you. That reminds me of a team that came to race in uh, Chicago, Illinois. We have a few series of multi-day crit races uh, down in the U.S. The Tour of America's Dairyland in Wisconsin and the Intelligentsia Cup in Chicago. These guys uh, flew into Chicago, did not rent a car. Their plan was to just ride from race to race. And uh, if you've ever been to Chicago or any big city, uh, these races are all over the suburbs. But when you look at it, on a map coming from Europe, it looks like you should just be able to ride back and forth. So after the first night of racing, uh, these guys came up to the stage and they were like, uh, we uh, need some help getting back to our host house. We thought we'd be able to ride around here. Not the case. Uh, Rude yes. awakening to uh, the, the American road system. How, how is it said it's uh, America where 100 years is a long time as opposed to Europe where 100 miles is a long way? Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. They couldn't believe it. Well, meanwhile, speaking of unbelievable things, who have we got at the front of this race but the ageless Bruce Bird and the almost as ageless Matt Usborne. And they have put in about a 200-meter gap over the chasing field, which consists of Warner, Ivani, Kersey, and others. Bauer, I think, being... So we've got a group of four, and then that group of four has another 350-odd-meter gap to our chasers so really the race has become group of two 
uh, being chased by a group of four. And there you can see it right on your screen. Usborn and Bird, Age and Guile, and they are being chased down by youth and exuberance. In the this is so so perfect for Bruce Bird right now. He might as well be an honorary above and beyond cancer team member because uh, he's going to have these two guys working for him back in a group with Bauer and Warner. They all obviously have the same goal of helping their teammate, Matt Usborne, up here in the breakaway. And what's good for Matt Usborne is good for Bruce Bird. So uh, I think these two guys back here are doing a nice job playing defense in the chase group on the right-hand side of your screen. Well, they let their uh, team leader for now do what he needs to do up in the breakaway with Matt Usborne and Bruce Bird. So leaders on the left, chasers on the right. As of these two, what are technically opponents in this race, might as well be teammates up in this breakaway because they got the same goal of trying to hold off this group of four behind them. Yes, they're teammates until one of them decides that it's time to betray the other. Right. Now, Brad, you've uh, got a lot more experience in watching both Bruce and Matt race in this virtual series. Do you have any sense of who might have the advantage if this group of two stays away to the finish? I'm going to say Usborne in a two-up sprint. If I had to put money on one, I would take Usborne in a head-to-head -head sprint. But Bruce Bird, incredibly dangerous in a long-range attack. So, like, from a kilometer out, that's where Bruce Bird shines. And I would not be surprised to see him try to make that work, try and go early on uh, the Paderberg so he doesn't have to deal with a finishing sprint with, uh, with Matt here. So, uh, yeah, I would take Usborne in a sprint, and I'll take Bird for the long-distance attack. Yeah, and long distance is relative here on the Paterberg, so I think that it probably qualifies as a long distance attack, even if he attacks at the bottom of that climb. It's yeah. only about yes. 400 meters there to the finish, but it's only about 150 meters of flat, so yeah. it takes a lot more time than you expect to get up that climb, as we've seen already in this race and in the previous races. But meanwhile, these two are still maintaining that nice solid 200 meter lead. We're there climbing up the Paterberg again, which means that we will have about uh, three laps to go, if I'm reading this right. And they will have completed just about 20 kilometers at this point. So there's everything to play for and lots of distance for this chasing group to make it up. But as you said, this is an unmotivated chase because half those riders are just sitting in and watching Matt, their teammate, uh, put in the time so the chase is really going to come down to whether Ivani and um, Kersey the two local boys want to uh, do the work and Bauer and Warner will be very very happy to accept any work yeah. that Ivani and Kersey want to contribute to this group of four yeah, it's just a matter of uh, whether Ivani and Kersey can collectively produce more watts than Usborne and Bird. If they can work together as a duo better than Usborne and Bird are or can, then that would mean that the Chasers would be able to start closing this gap. But look at this, left-hand side of the screen, Matt Usborne dropping Bruce Bird a little bit on the way up. This is not how you work together in a breakaway, but I think part of this is just because of uh, the nature of the climb. Bird lost contact. Usborne might wait a little bit for Bruce Bird here. I think you probably want to keep Bruce with you as long as you can in this scenario. 12.5 kilometers to go, still a good amount of racing with uh, what is only 300, 350 meters, let's say, back to the Chasers. I'd keep Bruce Bird around as long as I can. Yeah, I'm afraid I've got a few technical difficulties on this end in terms of a dog who wants to debate me. This is like when a dog gets on the course at the Tour de France. This is the virtual version of a dog getting into the race. We haven't quite written the software to release random dogs onto the RGT platform, so we're doing it through the commentary. I like it. <laughs> well, thanks for your patience with me there, Brad. Uh, I may just try to soldier on with a bit of barking dog here in the background until I can't stand it. Then I'll go yell at him a bit. That's exactly what he wants. Don't give in. All right, he seems to have calmed down for a moment, so let's see if we've got some bike racing going on. Look at the Bruce right side Bird of the screen. Is... Look at this group. 
I'm watching the Chasers. Uh, singled out, single file, but look who's consistently at the back. Bauer and Warner doing a really good job of sitting on this group. Remember, I was talking a lot today about how difficult it is to ride in the group, just to stay in the group. It's even more difficult to sit on a group on RGT, and that's what Bauer and Warner are doing here. They're making sure that they don't help Kersey or Ivani because they have a teammate, Matt Usborne, up the road. But to just sit on the back requires a feather touch that uh, Warner and Bauer are both exhibiting today. So really nice job by these above and beyond cancer guys doing what they need to do for their teammate Matt Usborne. That's right. To torment Tim Crabbe's famous metaphor from his classic novel The Rider, uh, these two are making sure that they are eating off the plates of Ivani and Kersey before they start on their own delicious meals of matches to be burned. At the front of the race, we still have Bird and Usborne together, so uh, neither of them has been able to make the escape, but that just means more fun for Usborne. He can count on B Bauer and Warner to control that chasing group. The gap is, it's now about 500 meters, if I'm reading those numbers right. Oh, yeah. over 600. So These guys Bird are and Usborne. Yeah. And again, it's they're only they're only being chased by two riders. So what this really is is the story of uh, my apologies. This is really the story of those two not being able to uh, keep the uh, not being able to uh, keep uh, in touch with Usborne and Bird, and being perfectly controlled by Warner and Bauer, who are both tactically ready to pounce on them, but also just a demotivational element. You've got two passengers in a chase of four. Yeah. And pretty soon we're going to have to start thinking about how that group of four works out in a finish. If uh, if these two don't come back and it's not looking good for the chasers trying to bring back Bird and Usborne pretty soon, they're going to be on to the final lap. And you've got to start thinking about these two really fresh riders in the chase that haven't been doing any work all day. Although Hayden Warner getting to the front now, maybe sensing some weakness in the group and thinking he can put the final nail in the coffin for some riders in here. But uh, if this came down to a sprint of four, these two guys are going to be really fresh when they get there. And that's going to be a major advantage the last time up the Paderberg. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Warner's made his attack, but it looks like he's been drawn back. It's just... But you've got to really feel for Kersey and Ivani. They are being tactically worked over here in just the mm -hmm. classical fashion. It's a perfect translation of real-world cycling tactics into the virtual world by, uh, by these two teammates, uh, uh, Warner and Bauer. Rider up the road, sit and control the brake. It's, you know, this is bike racing 101. And uh, you could learn tactics from what we're seeing right here and apply them directly to a real-world road race. I feel bad like I'm watching Kersey and Ivani getting beat up and there's nothing I can do about it. Just getting well, worked wanted, over by these above and beyond cancer guys. If they didn't like suffering, they wouldn't be bike racers, Brad. So That's true. Uh, they've done it to themselves, really. So, but let's uh, let's give credit to Ivani and Kersey for providing us with a whole bunch of entertainment this lovely Saturday afternoon as they desperately try to chase back to Usborne and uh, Bird who are continuing to maintain a solid, solid lead on this field. They're going to be getting to the bottom of the Paderberg for their uh, penultimate climb here. As they will see... Uh, no, they will see two to go, so this is their anti-penultimate climb. Math is hard. You'll have to... Do the math for me here. Uh, don't look at me. I went to public way. school in the United States. You do not want me uh, doing any math. Very well. Deepest sympathies. They've got eight kilometers to go, which means that, yes, this will be their antepenultimate climb up the hill. They'll have two more after this. They will see two laps to go once they get to the top. But Usborne and Bird are simply putting on a clinic in terms of how you establish a breakaway on this Paderberg course and then keep it. And they've got four brave chasers with them, but two of them are teammates of Usborne. And so clearly they're an interest in doing about zero work until they have completely worked over Kersey and Ivani. As you said, we're seeing them just get brutalized in virtual form there. Imagine all six of these riders just grinding away in their, uh, in their uh, indoor cycling caves, suffering mightily, staring at the screen, 
managing all the tactics because of course as you've said already it's really hard to manage and maintain a draft without paying a lot of attention so all these riders are doing that and look at this it appears oh, man. that warner and borrower have gotten away let's see if they're going to make this stick i think i just watched bauer take ivani's lunch money and then rocket up to the top of this <laughs> climb after bullying them for two laps they finally went for the ko here on uh, the patterberg here so a little bit of separation for the above and beyond cancer riders maybe this is it maybe they're thinking uh, all right they've done the work now we can pop them off here on the climb ivani doing a nice job holding on to that wheel and kersey gonna get back in here too so uh, i don't think they're gonna be able to get rid of them here although still a lot of climbing to go they're about halfway up the climb now but certainly looked like warner and bauer wanted to uh, apply some pressure there to me yeah, absolutely. And they didn't quite succeed because we see Avani right back there. And I, I wa I'm watching Kersey rubber band here. If you saw this in real life, you'd know that that was a rider who was on the end of their tether, right? That they're maybe going to make it to the top of this hill. But when you have to climb this same hill two more times, uh, once in 4K and once in 4K after that, uh, I don't see Kersey making it over this hill two more times. But this is where you do the damage, right? Uh, the uh, Above and Beyond team is now putting Kersey in huge difficulty, and that'll pay dividends for them over the last eight yep. kilometers. They will only have to worry about one rider for third place, not two. As if things couldn't get any worse for Ivani, now he's going to potentially find himself alone with these Above and Beyond Cancer guys if uh, Kersey doesn't survive the next time up the Paderberg. That's going to put Ivani in a very, very tough position. Yeah, absolutely. This is an unfair fight in cycling terms, but the whole point of cycling is to make the fight unfair. And like you say, Above and Beyond has been giving a master class in how to be mean to people on a bike race. This can be the most frustrating thing in the world, isn't it? When, when you're in a group and you're like, just help a little bit, just pull through. But when a rider has instructions or a teammate up the road, it... Uh, it doesn't make any sense for them to help you catch their teammate. So it often uh, elicits a very frustrated response from a lot of riders in a breakaway. When, uh, when riders refuse to work, when they have passengers sitting on it, can sort of mentally eat away at the other riders wanting just a little bit of help. And I'm wondering if Kersey and Ivani might be getting to that point now. They have been uh, trying to bring back time up to Usborne and Bird, but... They've uh, only been losing time as these guys approaching one kilometer between our two leaders and the chasers. That's right. And with one kilometer gap on a race where they only have six and a half kilometers left to go, I think that Ivani and Kersey are now going to stop thinking about catching the lead group and start thinking about the battle for third place. So they've done a lot of work but my guess is that within moments that work will stop and that group of four will be racing tactically for third place now they still have two problems the first problem is if annie and kersey have done a lot more work than warner and bauer and the second problem is that if annie and kersey are not teammates but bauer and warner are so bauer and warner can execute all the classic teammate tactics from a group of four one of them is likely to go off the front and force a chase from Bauer and, and Kersey, uh, sorry, Ivani and Kersey, in order to make them do even more work while the second rider sits in and enjoys the prizes. And indeed, is that Warner doing a little surge off the front there? Maybe. Is that Bauer doing a little surge off the front? <laughs> I, I can also, I know that these guys maintain a back channel of communication. The Above and Beyond Cancer team has a Discord channel server that they run for these virtual races. So Usborne, Bauer, and Warner are all going to be in vocal contact with one another uh, during this race. So they know exactly what's going on. They can time a move to the second. I mean, if they really want to say, like, let's go in three, two, one, they can do it because these guys all have uh, comms in between them. Nice. So virtual uh, team radio for virtual yeah, bike racing. Exactly. Exactly. And some of these teams also em employ directors for virtual racing. Uh, we saw some of the Project Echelon riders in the rider previews before we got to, uh, to the start of the race. We're going to be seeing them later on in the series. A lot of times they'll have a rider who's or a, a uh, 
director whose sole job is just monitor the situation, looking for maybe any GC threats, just like a regular director would in the team car, trying to uh, check the time gaps, make sure that there's no new virtual leaders going up the road, anything like that. And uh, yeah, they'll use Discord or another one of the uh, chat platforms to uh, to communicate and make sure that they always know what's going on. So it's getting serious out there in the virtual racing world. Indeed it is. So we've got two great races going here. Uh, Usborne and Bird are approaching the uh, climb, their penultimate climb of the uh, the uh, of the Paderberg. And meanwhile, I think that I'm detecting a little bit of weakness in our group of four. No, they've come back Grupo Compato. I think Kersey was sort of rubber banding off the back there for a moment, but he's got back in touch. So we're going to watch uh, Matt and Bruce give it to each other for the second to last time as they go up the Paderberg cheered on by those raucous virtual fans who they can actually hear as they go up here they must be loving it they know that this is now a race for first and second and i'll bet you that neither one of those riders is in any way satisfied with the idea of second place <laughs> they will be thinking of that with about as much delight as ricky bobby would enjoy not being first if you ain't first you're last as they it's, say uh, as a the great poet Ricky Bobby once wrote. That is right. That is right. Yes, Talladega Nights is a movie which has much to teach the student of bike racing, despite it being about NASCAR, despite it being a comedy starring Will Ferrell. Getting back to now our we, group of four. The, wait, before we get back to it, now, now we just need to see the Warner Bauer shake and bake move at the end here. And we'll have the, the perfect confluence of Talladega Night references. Yes, indeed. But who will be our Jean Pierre? Perhaps we can <laughs> hang that tag on Bruce Bird, who's right. come from out of town to teach Matt Usborne how to bike racing works. It's actually remarkably similar to the plot line of Talladega Nights. Now that uh, now that you mention it, you got the out of towner going up against the hometown hero and Bird and Usborne, and then group of four chasing behind him trying to shake and bake their way to the final podium spot for the above and beyond cancer team and, and back on to like, the climb oh yeah look at this warner like, going he's shaking and bowers bacon <laughs> and meanwhile at the front of the race there's also a gap developing between usborne and bird um i can see from the numbers that there's about 40 meters difference and look at that i think usborne may be trying to make this move stick that's a pretty nice gap if you can carry that back to the bottom of the Paderberg. Coming this up happened last lap, too, K. though. I saw uh, Bruce oh, Berg got dropped last time up to the top and was able to catch back on to Usborne, maybe even the last two laps. So maybe it is uh, just a function of the climb. Usborne can climb a little bit better, maybe, which would be uh, an ominous preview to the finish for Bruce Bird. But it seems like Bird has been getting dropped at the top of the climb pretty much every time through. Yeah, absolutely. And having seen Usborne in real life, I can tell you nobody would um, mistake him for a natural climber, at least in terms of physique. So uh, assuming that he's got an honest weight uh, uh, inputted through the rigorous virtual weighing process, then he's probably getting a bit of an advantage on the descents. How about Kersey attacking here on the way up? Got himself a little bit of space over Bauer and Ivani. And where's and now Warner? The tables are turned. Yeah. So Kersey doing the attack. Let's see if Bauer and Warner can chase back on, but I think that they are now going to have to have an honest race. They can't depend on uh, basically Kersey and Ivani just casually doing all the work. This is a for serious attack, and these three, these four riders are riding for third place. So let's see what happens next. And this is the best thing Kersey can do. It's like, take the fight to them. Take them out of the position of being in charge, of making the decisions, of driving this breakaway. And Kersey's like, I'm the captain now, to make another movie reference here. He's, uh, he's letting these guys know that he's not just going to go down the way that Above and Beyond Cancer wants things to go here. Kersey's like, if you're going to dominate this breakaway, you're going to have to go through me. Just so, and who's the first victim of this attack? It's Warner. Warner is yeah. gone from this group, and he will not come back. Bauer and Ivani are desperately trying to keep in contact, but this is Kersey's move. He's got to see if he can hold that gap. It's about five meters to Bauer in closing, and ooh, 
But I wonder if Kersey and Ivani can now work as teammates in the sense that can Ivani do oh, a counterattack right off this? Definitely, wheel? man. To punish Bauer here. Uh, why not? You know, <laughs> these guys have been beating up on you all day. This is your chance to get back at him. You got ba Bauer isolated here. If Kersey and Ivani can communicate here and figure out a way to get rid of Bauer, that would be a pretty amazing upset out of this group of four because uh, this was definitely ABC's race to lose, uh, having two guys out of this chase group of four. They've already dropped one in Hayden Warner and uh, now Bauer on his own. Kersey and Ivani surely speak the language of wattage, and they will understand right. when their legs do the talking. We're going back to the front of the race now because it's only two kilometers to go for Osborne and Bird, and as you predicted, they are back together. Grupo Compacto, as my old friend the late Jeremy Story would say, a uh, local name known to many riders around here, a great coach and organizer of events. But Osborne and Bird, they are now riding hammer and tongs 1.8k to go so they're about one and a half kilometers just a little less from the foot of the Paderberg which is surely where their race will be decided and things on the getting, back of the field I was just gonna say things getting spicy over on the right hand side of the screen these guys going back and forth over in the chase up here been seeing uh a constant shuffling up at the front of this group. And let's be clear, the chase is over for these three guys. You are not going to catch those two up the road uh, who are, for them, down to about a kilometer of racing. So this is about the race for third, without a doubt, for Bauer, Kersey, and Ivani. And then uh, Hayden Warner, you see, stuck back in no man's land there in what looks like uh, will be sixth place for him. Don't see him getting caught by Frazier Moran, and don't see him catching back onto this group. So I think Warner is... Uh, where he's going to be for the rest of the day today. These are the three that have to work out third place. And then, of course, Bruce Bird and Matt Usborne up the road. I don't really have a pick out of this group of three. I mean, uh, the way that these guys have been riding, I think, has all been pretty fairly matched. Bauer did a lot of work early on. Kersey has showed he's incredibly strong with that attack getting away, uh, strong enough to drop Warner. And then Ivani has just kind of been... Uh, taking the punches throughout the day today. So uh, I don't know that there's a clear favorite in this group of three for me. Then again, the leaders, oh I think goodness. it comes down to, oh, oh, Warner's back. Hello. <laughs> I guess things got too tactical in that group and Warner found an extra gear, but he is back when I had written him off. So chapeau, Mr. Warner, you're back in business. And I did not think you would be there. But now we've got to go and watch Usborne and Bird because this is going to be 400 meters of utter savagery. Just watch the watts per kilo numbers. That will tell you everything you need to know as these two have got about, what would you say, about 60 seconds of utter agony in their future. Yeah, yeah, right around there. If Bird was going to go early, I think he already missed the opportunity because Usborne is, uh, he can do it from this distance. He can hold about a minute of that insane power. Look at this, Bird at 7 watts per kilo, Usborne at 7.3 as uh, these guys hit their peaks on the day, catching up to some lap riders. Now, they won't affect the riding here. These guys will be able to go right through them on the platform. You see, Usborne doesn't get caught behind him or anything like that. So, Usborne gapping off Bird here. Uh, if Bird was going to do this, I think he needed to make the gap early on. So, uh, things looking better and better for Matt Usborne here on the way up, down to 230 meters to go for Bruce Bird. Yeah, this is no bluff. Usborne is just crossing the 20% uh, grade. The slope is now easing off. He's got enough gap. He's 30 meters is more than enough for him to sit up, zip up his jersey, and raise his virtual hands above his virtual head. Because Matt Usborne is our winner today. He executed every piece of that, ta of that uh, race perfectly. And Bruce Bird has to be... He probably won't be happy with second place, but boy, he sure did a lot of work and it is a well-deserved podium position. I will say Bruce Bird is probably happy with the ability to get some separation. He was a breakaway rider through and through in the Echelon Racing League. Very rarely did that work out for riders to be able to win or at least survive out of a breakaway. So I think Bruce will at least find some consolation in the fact that, hey, he and Matt made the break work today, right? The break stuck. So you can take some pride in that, that uh, you were able to hold these guys off. Meanwhile, we go back to the race for third. Hayden Warner is back out of this group. Remember, he had charged back in and now... He's about 100 meters back, so it's down to these three, down to these two as Power and Ivani go, <laughs> dropping Kersey. 
Although Kersey's going to pull a Hayden Warner here and charge back. I think Kersey showed making... the most strength early on. Uh, remember, he had that really strong attack last lap. He just crested 10 watts per kilogram, so he must be all out sprinting at this point. Can he possibly hold that for this whole climb? I know Bauer is matching him. He's going into double digits on his watts per kilo as well. This is an incredible race for third place. Bauer looks to be coming back. He's coming over Kersey. I think that Kersey and Ivani were just forced to do too much nice. work. Kersey's nice. exploded. That's it. Right there. Winning move for Timmy Bauer. Well, winning out of this group as uh, Bauer right there. Going to make it to the top, and that should secure third place for him. It happened in the last 50 meters of the climb on the Paderbrook. I think you're right. Kersey just absolutely imploded just as they got to the top. Bauer takes advantage of it. That'll be one and three for Above and Beyond Cancer on the podium. They'll have a, a Bruce Bird sandwich in uh, second place there. And then looks like Kersey going to hold on for fourth place unless Ivani and Warner could sneak through. Not going to do it. So we'll put Kersey on the wide-angle podium in fourth. And then looks like Ivani should be able to hold on for fifth today. Actually, things played out almost exactly as you would want them with Above and Beyond Cancer. You got your win. You got your best-case scenario out of the breakaway in third with, uh, with Bauer. And then Warner blew himself up. That's, uh, you know, they, they did the best that they could getting a guy into first and third. So I think Warner can be happy with this ride today. He contributed, no doubt, today. Yeah, absolutely. I think they'll be, yeah, anytime you can take that many positions, that they just executed on their race strategy, as you discussed, right from the gun, just as they would want to. So, yeah, you know, compliments all around for the uh, above and beyond team. They absolutely showed you how you do virtual racing and uh, really it's very much like how you do a real bike race isn't it so now we're yeah, watching alex feeling, Fraser right? on yeah when you get to that finish line and uh, you find out that your teammate has won you you did the work out on course but uh, i love informing teammates when they hit the finish line as an announcer like who won the race because they don't know until they come in and it's like the plan worked, you know, all that effort paid off today. So I hope Above Beyond Cancer is feeling that. Meanwhile, Fraser Moran on the way in here, going to salvage a, looks like seventh place on the day. I don't think he'll be caught by Oliphant behind him. So uh, I think Fraser Moran showing some potential on RGT today. That's right. He's a credible result considering the level of competition. He did manage to ride away from Oliphant. I think they were together for much of the race. And then Oliphant is just barely gapping Navin, Cooper, and it looks like Watson is sort of broadly part of that group. And then we're going to go back to a somewhat longer rate, wait for Moore and Terblanche to uh, come home. Navin, Navin and Cooper are going to have a good battle to the line together. Oh, it's going to be a teammates. And, oh, uh, I'm going to go Cooper on that one. Cooper got it. Computer agrees with you. So we've got Watson yes. here, just closing on the finish for 11th place. And then we're going to see, we'll be able to cut back to a drag race between Moore and Dra Terre Blanche. They're still riding together at two kilometers to go. So they're a little ways from getting to the foot of the uh, Peterberg. And they appear to be our last two riders on the course. Everybody else has dropped. So we're going to have... 13 total finishers, and we're going to have these two youngsters, Moore and Terre Blanche, both locals, both pretty good riders. Probably not the results they wanted, but I think that they'll be uh, pretty excited to uh, ride at home and have a, a nice dicey finish between the two of them. But meanwhile, we look at the yeah, uh, top 10 here, and it's just what we saw, Usborne Bird, Timmy Bauer taking third place uh, for Above and Beyond. And then Braden Kersey managed to uh, get a result for tag cycling on the extended mountain bike podium, along with uh, Karsten Ivani. Look at the watts per kilogram to... between uh, Kersey and Ivani, 4.67, 4.54. And then look at the watts per kilogram of the Above and Beyond Cancer Riders, Hayden Warner at 4.09, Timmy Bauer at 4.12. So we know who did the work in that chase of four. They really put Kersey and Ivani on the spot, but uh, they did a nice job to try and survive, but uh, just couldn't overcome that Above and Beyond Cancer barrage. Strength in numbers for those guys today as Matt Usborne gets the win. Alex Frazier Moran down in seventh, Aiden Oliphant in eighth, Cooper and Navin, the Triple X teammates rounding up the top 10 
in 9 and 10. Safe to say today, Ryan, worthy winners in all of our categories. Uh, we had our amateur races throughout the day this morning. Jackie Godby dominating the women's race, and then Matt Usborn, I would say a worthy winner here in the men's race on the Paderberg. Yeah, on this power course, you could see that it was sort of a show of power, especially by our elite men and women racers. I mean, Usborn brought Bird with him to the finish line, but the two of them were clearly the class of the field. And then Godby on the other side with the women's race was just in a class of her own against uh, some pretty credible competition among some elite local women. Well, really cool to be able to see all these riders coming out and racing together in the virtual BC Cup as uh, Cycling BC continues to offer more opportunities to race. Ryan, I would say all in all, a successful first day of racing in the virtual BC Cup. And the best part, we got three more to come. So I hope you're as excited about next weekend at Canary Wharf as I am. I'm thrilled by what we've seen, and I hope that everybody will take the opportunity to uh, register for those upcoming events because you can see how much fun we had with this one, and I'm hoping we'll have even more fun in these uh, weeks to come. So thank you very much, Brad. It's been a pleasure hosting this event with you this morning. Registration is open right now for uh, next weekend's racing at cyclingbc.net. You can sign up for the Canary Wharf race on April 10th, the Dirty Reaver race on April 17th, and then last stop of the series on uh, May 1st. And uh, we'll pick the course after we go through the uh, three very different courses coming up here in the first three stops of the virtual BC Cup. So that's going to be it for today as uh, we wrap up another exciting and i'll say successful day of racing so that's it for us for ryan kuzino my name is brad soner saying thanks for watching we will see you next weekend april 10th for stage two at canary wharf